This conference will now be recorded. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining the first meeting of the Council on Participatory Democracies. The, my name is Virginia Fiume, and I am the coordinator of Humans, uh, one of the organizations to launch this event. And of course, we have a bit of background noise, so make sure that your microphones are switched off. Okay, so um, I think it's quite a news to have uh, a group of European citizens willing to discuss uh, connected from every corner of Europe in uh, this very peculiar situation, just to use an euphemism. Uh, what we're gonna do today is to um, discuss together sorry guys there is a dog and i don't want to say anything bad about dogs but if you can switch off your microphones this is gonna run a bit more smoothly so okay massimiliano cool. nespola puoi chiudere il microfono okay a bit of technical things before the official kickoff you all have micro, uh, a control panel on the left of GoToMeeting where you can turn on and off your microphone. And it's very important to keep the microphone switched off when someone else is talking, otherwise there is a lot of background noise and this does help the uh, quality of the meeting. Uh, I remind to the organizers who has a specific permission level on GoToMeeting that you can switch off the microphones of the people like dictatorially so do it if needed okay let's do it again good evening uh, good afternoon everyone and welcome to the first meeting of the council on participatory democracy uh, my name is virginia fiume and i am the coordinator of humans who, which is one of the organization that called for this uh, um, self-convocated citizen assembly um, a few days and weeks before the outbreak of the coronavirus. The organizations involved in these projects are Humans, uh, ACIT Foundation, uh, European Alternatives, The Good Lobby and the Centre d'Action Laïque uh, of Belgium. And uh, together we uh, thought uh, a few months ago about uh, um, identifying what could be a way to uh, move the needle of participatory democracy and make sure that it citizens could really have an impact in European policies. When we first called for this meeting, uh, uh, as, I, as I was saying, the coronavirus outbreak wasn't uh, there. Uh, therefore, our debate was more focused on uh, a general approach uh, of uh, the best instruments to, to shape the EU policies, uh, the best policies to be discussed and then, and then implemented. Uh, through participatory democracy as a complementary instrument uh, of uh, representative democracy. Um, throughout the day, we will go through all of this, so I will not take long to, to the introduction, but I just want to say that uh, we are really facing a, uh, a moment that no one, has, no one would have Im had imagined, and uh, the fact that as citizens and organizations, we decided to spend uh, an afternoon and a uh, morning uh, discussing together uh, what can be done, how it can be done in terms of uh, health, safety, uh, respect of the rule of law and democracy, uh, and uh, civil protection uh, can become really a blueprint uh, that uh, is in this historical moment. Um, you all have seen the structure of the event in the communication that we have sent, but I want to recap what's gonna happen this afternoon and tomorrow morning. So this afternoon, we are gonna mainly focus on participatory democracy instruments. A lot of things are and were and will be on the table uh, in the previous months and in the next months. When we first called for the meeting, uh, there was a starting the debate around the conference on the future of Europe. And of course, there is an ongoing debate on the effectiveness and impact of participatory democracy instruments. And of course, there is always the underlying topic of the reform of the treaty. All of these things uh, today, in a day like today, 
will necessarily need to be tackled in the scenario of a state of emergency. So everything that we will say today, I recommend we try to keep it tight uh, between the fine line of uh, the ideal, the reality on the ground, and the effectiveness of the situation. Um, today we're going to focus on this, whilst tomorrow we will focus on uh, how participatory democracy instruments could be used uh, to make policy proposals uh, around the coronavirus emergency, which of course, in my opinion, has three main areas, uh, health, uh, welfare and economics, uh, and fundamental rights, but we can expand on that. Uh, now we have a round of uh, introductions, starting from Marco Cappato, and then the European Alternatives teams, and then Pier Virgilio Dassoli, to kind of frame the debate. Uh, and then we will go through some quick intro to the three main sessions uh, that were planned for today. So the Conference on the Future of Europe, it still makes sense how, when, participatory democracy instruments, what is available, what can be used, what should be improved, and the last bit around the democratization of the European Union. Uh, we have really light intervention from the main team uh, organizers. In general, everyone here can uh, speak and bring its own contribution. Uh, in the control panel, there is a chat element through which you can say if you want to speak. And our team will uh, make sure that I receive all the um, information about the people that want to speak. I recommend to try to keep a first uh, uh, your first intervention in around uh, five, six minutes, uh, so that more people will have the possibility to, to talk, and then we can always have second and third interventions. Um, Octavian is now going to share in the chat a link to a document that you should have all received via email. Uh, the document has three sections. One is a collaborative note section, so everyone can type what we are saying, and also, once you do your intervention, it would be nice if you can, with your name and organization, write the bullet points so that everything is easy to manage afterwards and during the working of this Council on Participatory Democracy. It contains some guidelines that were prepared before the event around the key issues and proposals on the three um, sessions that we're going to discuss, Conference on the Future of Europe, Participatory Democracy Instruments, and uh, Democratization of the European Union. Uh, and then there is a third document, which is a draft mm -hmm. proposal for a petition that the humans team put together. Uh, it can be used as a working basis, but uh, feel free to add stuff into that document. Let's make it alive as alive we need to be politically today. So I would give the first word to Mar Marco Cappato, uh, former MEP, founder of Humans, uh, and a lot of other things. And uh, Marco is going to tell us uh, how we arrived to this day today and uh, a bit of political and uh, approach uh, to, this, uh, to this council. And then we will have the other guys. So Marco, the floor, is, the digital floor is yours. Thank you, Virginia. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, well. okay. Um, good afternoon to everybody and thank you very much for uh, accepting this invitation. I know that in reality, even uh, if uh, most of us uh, are stuck at home, but uh, there are more things to do and, uh, and work to do sometimes uh, during these days can than normal. So I know this is a precious time for everybody. Uh, the idea of creating a network of uh, uh, with a, a quasi institutional name as Council on Participatory Democracy uh, came after a first meeting in Brussels in November uh, when it came clear to us that many different groups working on many different issues uh, were in reality united in trying to activate the tools of citizens' participation. Uh, we thought it would have been useful to have a kind of neutral platform for sharing of experience and um, also for exploring the possibilities of common proposals. Um, this is also the reason why with uh, Virginia Fiume we divided the agenda in two parts. Uh, today discussing about how to reform the tools, uh, which are the tools, uh, Conference for the Future of Europe, um, the instruments of participation, 
and even the EU treaty themselves, themselves, they are also in a way a tool. Uh, tomorrow morning, discussing about proposal um, on which to activate on the merit, uh, rule of law, environment, freedom, rights, social justice, science, and of course the current uh, coronavirus crisis. Uh, um, the crisis is. Uh, of course, uh, dramatically changing political priorities as it is uh, changing our individual lives. Uh, we decided still to maintain the occasion of this debate because uh, we are convinced that the need of uh, Europe, a Europe in which citizens' participation in particular and liberal democracy more in general are much more needed uh, in a moment of emergency. Um, more than that, if you look to European history, we see that uh, the very uh, funding of uh, the European community uh, more than half a century ago uh, was uh, a reaction to the tragedy of World War II. And every leap forward to European integration uh, was a reaction to a challenge of that time. Uh, this means that also this crisis could uh, mean a lot to Europe. Uh, on, 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 on one hand or in one direction, it could provoke a new wave of fear and nationalism. Uh, it is already somehow happening. Or, in alternative, it could trigger a new awareness of how further integration and fostering of European democracy is needed. Um, in, um, in our organization, Humans, uh, we prepared a draft petition to the European Parliament, hoping that the European Parliament will not shut down, because also this is a risk, uh, asking for some urgent measures of uh, coordination, security, emergency management and civil protection, but also structural reforms at the European level. Um, for direct competencies on health policies and on global level too, for further empowerment of the World Health Organization. Uh, well, as uh, organizer of this meeting, we are proposing to you um, not to give up with the planned discussion, uh, with the agenda initially foreseen. So the planned discussion on the Conference of the Future of Europe even if we don't know if it's confirmed, uh, the dates and so on. Uh, the discussion on the participatory tools, petitions, European citizen initiatives, the possibility of uh, citizen assemblies, and about the reform of the treaties. Uh, some of you could uh, maybe consider it uh, as a mistake, as if we pretended to consider the current crisis as, a, I don't know, as a business as usual. Well, it is not. Uh, nobody could uh, nourish uh, such an illusion, but uh, uh, let's see from a different angle. What is apparently useless during an emergency? Well, if we are not disposed to, to abandon or to dismiss it, so we have to reform it, to make it become useful. So it is true for participatory democracy, petitions, uh, European citizen initiatives, the ombudsman, there is nothing that can be really effective now. So what? Uh, either we accept to abandon participatory democracy, if it were a luxury good uh, to be sold uh, during a hard time or a time of war, either we should fight to defend it, to activate it, to use it in a way. And uh, it is true also for democracy uh, in itself. The European Parliament will probably suspend its activity, um, maybe because somebody considered it useless uh, in a time in which heads of governments are taking vital decisions in, in teleconference, so they are closing borders, arguing on medical equipment, uh, and so on. Or we should better ask for a extraordinary plenary session, maybe partially in video conference, to have a real first European debate before public opinion about all the main aspects of the crisis. We will see if the 
the plenary session of the parliament will be confirmed or not. Well, uh, I said before, what is apparently useless during an emergency, uh, we, if we are not disposed to abandon it, we have to reform it. It is also true for the European Union uh, in itself, in a way. Um, this is why I think it's perfectly adequate to maintain our agenda, to go through the very specific points that are summarized in the working document prepared by Sibylla Barbieri and Octavian Lazian. Um, it is not a distraction, I think. We are not talking about things that are made irrelevant by coronavirus. Uh, we are talking about goals that become much more needed now than before. Uh, Pier Virgilio D'Astoli will explain how the Altero Spinelli project voted by the European Parliament in 1984 would have given Europe the necessary powers to face uh, a pandemic, but national governments missed that opportunity at that time as they missed the opportunity of the SARS pandemic to radically reform powers and rules, for example, for with the Lisbon Treaty. So, to, to, co to finish, um, the, the meeting of today and tomorrow morning, I think, is the first effort in order not to miss this new opportunity, too, and uh, try to uh, do some maybe minor, maybe humble, concrete things that could become very useful in uh, the crisis that uh, we are living through. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Marco Cappato. And uh, I say hello to the people who joined uh, now and for the people that are following on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, just a reminder that you can prefer to, to talk, adding your name into the chat. So the next step now is, thanks to the European Alternatives team, we should have uh, uh, Lorenzo Milanesi, uh, no, Lorenzo Marusili, Nicola Milanesi, and uh, Martin Paire. Uh, they are all connected from three different cities, I guess it's Palermo, London, and Berlin. And uh, before kicking off, they're going to give us a, a quick overview of uh, uh, what's happening in three dif very different states of Europe and one of which is not in the European Union, unfortunately, which is the UK. Uh, so I leave the word to flow to the European Alternative Teams for a trip around Europe whilst we're stuck at home. So maybe, maybe I will go first. I'm Nicolo Milanese. I'm not in London, actually. I'm in uh, the Arden Forest. So I usually live in, in, in France, so I can speak just briefly about uh, the situation in France and also in the UK, which is where I was, where I was born. That's the reason that Virginia uh, thought, thought I was perhaps in London. Uh, in France, as you probably know, we're all stuck inside. Uh, the government uh, crazily had the elections on, on, on Sunday, uh, but seems now to have realized that this was a kind of mistake and announced that everybody should stay in their homes uh, the, the day afterwards and have cancelled the, the second tour, second round of the elections. Um, as far as I can assess the atmosphere, um, the atmosphere when I went outside today seems that people were more worried than they were yesterday. And I think that over the past week, we could say that many people have started to really understand uh, how dangerous the virus is. Um, if you look at the behavior of still some people, you've probably seen pictures of people in Paris uh, still out and about. Maybe not everybody has uh, fully understood this, but now they have police officers explaining it to them. Um, from my contacts in the UK, it seems like um, because the government has done such a terrible job in explaining what the virus is and, and the dangers of it, the large parts of the population have not yet fully understood um, quite uh, how serious the situation is, but more and more people uh, are waking up to it. And indeed, you've probably seen that the government having uh, announced last week that more or less everything would carry on as normal, um, no doubt thinking that it was an economic opportunity that the rest of Europe shuts itself down for the UK to be continued to be open for business. 
uh, has now started to have to change its policy. Um, they are still ruling out uh, trapping people in their houses, or, or, um, but they've decided now to close the schools from tomorrow. And there's more and more demand for uh, stricter confinement and certainly for more and more testing. Um, I think that a European dimension is very relevant if I'm going to make the comparison between France and the UK, because you may have seen that the French Prime Minister uh, was calling for travel to be limited between the UK and France if the UK doesn't change its policy. Um, and this is just a metaphor for wider lack of coordination between uh, European countries, whether they're in the European Union or uh, on their way out of the European Union. Um, that the closing of borders is the sign that the countries are unable to coordinate themselves uh, properly. And so I think that, um, again, with, like with the financial crisis, we're, we're in a situation where um, the political institutions are not sufficiently responsive um, to properly address the situation, and it falls partly to citizens to uh, organize themselves and to make clear demands on their politicians. Um, there's been uh, quite a big petition in the UK um, to get the to get the government to try and change its policy. Um, and so I think the example of what we're doing today is is the right kind of example, uh, showing that citizens can uh, find ways of connecting with each other across borders where the politicians are are, are struggling. Um, and we're taking taking advantage of this extremely difficult situation uh, to try and have some imagination about what the future of Europe could be. So I'm, I'm happy that there's so many people joining us today. Maybe I'll stop there. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, Martin or Lorenzo? Martin, are okay. You looking for... okay. Uh, I was seeing Martin looking for something on his camera. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> hello everyone. I, I've switched my camera off because I, I, I see most of you as frozen on camera. This might be a sign of what the Financial Times was writing this morning that the EU broadband is already under strain by the amount of uh, remote work that's coming up. So let's see and let's hope that this doesn't go any further than this. We have been already deprived of physical mobility. Would be pretty much a shame to also be deprived of uh, online. It's online equivalent. Um, uh, so I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm speaking to you from Palermo, which is possibly the best part of the worst part of Europe at the moment, uh, in the sense that the south of Italy is spared the uh, numbers and uh, tragedy that we are seeing in the north of the country. For, for a number of reasons, the, the most optimistic hope that weather has something to do with it. Uh, and clearly there has been a delay in terms of the, the time scale of the spreading of the virus so that containment measures have worked uh, perhaps more effectively because they came at, at an earlier stage uh, in the south of Italy. So the, the, uh, the psychologies and the morale of the people, I would say, is probably as upbeat as it gets in a situation like this compared to the rest of the country. But of course, all the measures of lockdown and so on and so forth also apply. What, uh, however, I think it's worth underscoring is that uh, I was really surprised at how um, a really chaotic, inconclusive, weak democracy such as Italy managed to effect uh, a national mobilization on a scale probably unseen since World War II in a matter of days. And of course, uh, due to the unfortunate time scale of the virus, it also happened to be the first uh, in Europe, but also the first Western democracy to introduce quite dramatic measures such as a quarantine for 60 million people. It's the first time that we see something like this. And it's telling that Italy was the first country to, to usher in this new course. The reason why I mention it is because we've been told for many, many years now, Viktor Orban was very fond of telling us that liberal democracies were weak, 
inconclusive, unable to address uh, crises and threats that the new world was throwing at us, and that authoritarian or illiberal democracies which were, were much more apt at being able to harness the level of national organization and power that was deemed necessary. And it's, in, it's interesting, I think, that uh, one of the weakest liberal democracies, one of the most chaotic liberal democracies, that is Italy, has actually shown that there is the opportunity of such rapid transformation to both an economic system and the customs and habits of 60 million people. The reason why I think that's important is because that is precisely what we need to be doing uh, in order to address also what we're discussing today and indeed other crises such as the climate crisis. We are faced in a historical moment where we know that the system we used to inhabit is dramatically unsustainable and unable to continue uh, through a business as usual mentality. And that's true whether we're looking at the European Union and its reforms that the Conference on the Future of Europe hopefully will manage to trigger. Uh, that's true if you look at the question of climate. That's true if you look at uh, wider geopolitical considerations and all the rest that you know very well about. And so to see that liberal democracy still has this power of mobilization, I think it's an important um, it's an important realization that we should hold dear. And it's something that ties in with what Marco was saying at the beginning about the EU always being regenerated through crisis. I think Virgilio will, will discuss this uh, in, a, in a moment in much uh, greater length and, uh, uh, and in a more interesting fashion. But the, uh, the, the moment we are in at the moment is one where we're seeing that large scale transformations are indeed possible. And if we manage to bring over this awareness from the current crisis to all the other crises that we need to address, then maybe we can harness a, a level of collective energy, of collective power. And it's difficult to use this word today, and I use it on purpose, collective optimism towards change, which is, which is the kind of predisposition that we dramatically needed even before the coronavirus crisis came about. And so hopefully Italy demonstrates that this is possible. And I think our work today and tomorrow is also going to see how we can leverage on this new awareness of the transformative powers of democracies to bring some of that transformation also to the European Union, because we all know that it, need, it needs it quite drastically and quite rapidly as well. Thank you very much, Lorenzo also for shading the light uh, from the perspective of uh, Orban and uh, um, one of the biggest line of uh, separation in, uh, in the European Union and uh, for the injection of optimism. Uh, so I see we have a first person um, that wants to talk, which is, who is Monica Frassoni. We will add it, we will add her to the list. And uh, let's keep with the other two interventions that we have prepared and then uh, the floor is going to be massively yours. Uh, so the next one, I guess, is Martin from Berlin, if I understood correctly. And then yes, we're going to have Peggy. Yes. Um, but I'm going to be very short because my colleagues have quite talked quite extensively now. Now, but I'm, I mean, so I'm in Berlin uh, at the moment. I'm not a French citizen, but I live there. Uh, and uh, I mean, yesterday uh, Angela Merkel made her first, I think, official address to to, to the German population and said that, uh, that this is serious now and uh, you should take it seriously too. I mean, in Germany, as you know, there is not a, a full lockdown yet. I mean, even so, some regions are considering it as a moment, like Bavaria. Uh, so, but life kind of is difficult but continues and people are still kind of outside and uh, even though most shops are completely closed only restaurants are open from six to eight to six to six sorry um and uh, yeah but what i wanted to um add maybe from what my colleagues have just said is um that in berlin there is also something quite uh, interesting going on with a lot of solidarity groups that have flourished on on social media on telegram on whatsapp on twitter everywhere to support uh, to support uh, neighborhoods support the elderly the homeless uh, the immunodepressive and i think in times of crisis of course there are lots of i mean like a whole state can actually mobilize uh, a whole population but also the population is mobilizing pretty much by themselves to also find ways of complementing 
or health system that might be that will be very very pressured in the next month and there has been a lot of yeah, talks about the german population on how to actually be as um, not affecting the health system as much as possible and even merkel in her address has said that uh has kind of defined that uh uh, solidarity uh, is uh, not this hamster mentality. Hamster mentality in Germany meaning that you buy uh, like lots of um, of preserves and toilet papers and etc. And that is not solidarity. So there is even uh, on this level like a lot of, of talks around solidarity. I mean, Germany has a chance, maybe perhaps compared to France and Italy, to um, have done like a massive testing at the very beginning of the COVID crisis and uh, have a lot more capacity in terms of intensive care uh, units and beds in, in hospitals and twice higher as France and Italy. But nevertheless, I mean, there was a lot of, uh, of solidarity organized. And that gives me at least a lot of hope because I, I see that there are lots of solutions that are proposed also by the citizens themselves, be it fundraiser, be it uh, local, uh, uh, support to neighbors individually or to collective associations uh, and I think uh, in, in crisis like that there is a lot of, uh, of potential to tap on this solidarity that is missing also because there is not coordination of an answer on the European level at the moment uh, and Germany has also closed its borders most of them I think uh, with the exception of Belgium and the Netherlands if I'm not mistaken uh, but uh, on the side of the population, there is a strong solidarity going on, and also beyond borders, and especially with the uh, with the refugees, also uh, at the Greek border right now, uh, with a lot of initiatives that I've been trying to support uh, them as well. That's just all what I wanted to add here. Yeah. So participatory democracy is, is for me particularly important here yeah, to foster now in this time of solidarity that is organizing itself. Thank you, Martin. Uh, so now um, a few topics were mentioned by Marco, Martin, Nicolò and Lorenzo, uh, mainly related to uh, on a lot of issues. And um, the next person to, to take the stage or the virtual stage is Pier Virgilio D'Astoli, who is the president of uh, Movimento Europeo, European Movement in Italy. And uh, what Virgilio will walk us through is uh, what the European uh, Union could have done at the starting of the outbreak, what could be done now, and what ideally we should try to focus on. It's a perspective that can uh, kind of then open up the stage for the debate and the contribution to everyone to have a sort of a compass of uh, the reality of the European institutions and the need for change that has always been a dream for the federalists uh, across uh, Europe. Uh, probably there is now it's a, a good time to put into practice what uh, having a federalist vision can be and so the stage is for Virgilio Dastoli to, to his uh, overview on this. Thanks to Virgilio for joining and I hope you can talk. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, so um, Mar Marco uh, remember the Spinelli draft treaty uh, we know uh, very well that uh, Europe, but not only Europe, have faced uh, in the last uh, uh, 30 years to different uh, um, pandemic or ep epidemic. The first one was the MEDCO, as you remember, in the middle of the year uh, 80s, then the bird flu, then the SARS, then the Ebola, and now we have COVID-19. COVID and uh, when we made the Spinelli Draft Treaty, we discovered that uh, it was possible that uh, uh, throughout the bone mill of the coup, it was possible to diffuse uh, a illness to the, uh, uh, to the people. And uh, that is uh, uh, one of the reasons, because uh, not only for the med coup, but uh, that was one of the reasons because in the Spinelli draft treaty uh, we uh, proposed to uh, organize the uh, share of competencies between the nation states and the European Union, giving to the European Union the capacity, if I can use this name, uh, 
to organize a kind of chain of command uh, to uh, fight against the pandemic or the epidemic and to assure uh, the uh, health promotion for the citizens. And that is the reason because we decided that the health uh, competence was not in the hands of the nation states, but in the Spinelli draft treaty, the health uh, competence was, uh, for the point of view of the uh, chain of command, was in the hands of the European Union uh, as a competing uh, competence uh, for the uh, European for the for the European Union. Uh, then uh, we know that we face the, as I say, the, for different uh, pandemic, the uh, bird flu, the SARS. Uh, the SARS, uh, as you know, uh, came uh, before the uh, adoption of the Lisbon uh, Treaty, and uh, um, even uh, because of the uh, SARS uh, virus, the nation states. Uh, didn't decide with the Spinelli, with the Lisbon Treaty to give to the European Union these uh, 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 strong competencies. And uh, as you, if you see the, Spinelli, the Lisbon Treaty, you can see that uh, the health uh, uh, policy is only a supporting uh, competence of the European Union, uh, maintaining them in the nation states uh, the competence uh, for the health. That is the reason because now with the uh, uh, co uh, coronavirus, uh, uh, we uh, had the reaction of the European Union that was too late and too little. Uh, the first case of the uh, uh, coronavirus arrived in Italy the 24th of January. And if, the, if you see that these 50 uh, days after the 24th of January, you can see that the reaction of the member states was uh, too late, too uh, little, and uh, too disparate. Uh, now the European Union decided finally to act, uh, and acting using some uh, uh, instruments that we have in the treaty, and that, you, uh, from my point of view, the European Commission had to, to use, uh, uh, not now, but uh, at the beginning of the crisis. We have uh, an article in the treaty saying that uh, we have to assure the security of the citizens uh, concerning the health, that is the Article uh, 5th of the Treaty of Lisbon. Then we have the article concerning the health, uh, that is the Article one, uh, 168. Then we have the civil protection, and then we have solidarity. So finally, from a certain point of view, uh, the European Union had the capacity to act, but I said, too, too, uh, too late and too little. Uh, and we have to know that uh, the problem is not only to fight against the virus, but the problem is also to organize the things after the virus, when we have to face a very high level of economic and social and political crisis. Uh, so the question is not only to help the states as the uh, European Central Bank decided yesterday with uh, uh, more or less 1 billion of uh, uh, euro, the problem is to organize uh, uh, economic and social policy at European level. So from this point of view, the question, and uh, that is a point in which we have to discuss, uh, is to create a, a federal budget assuring to the uh, European citizens public goods that uh, it's not possible to assure uh, at national level. Uh, so that is the question that we have to discuss uh, concerning the future of Europe. But concerning the future of Europe, uh, you spoke about the European Conference on the Future of Europe. This conference for, the, for, the, for this moment uh, is a kind of uh, unidentified flying object. Uh, nobody knows uh, when uh, this conference will start, it's quite sure that this conference don't start uh, the night of May. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, this conference will start this year. And in any case, the aptitude uh, and the approach of the institutions is to use uh, this sentence that you uh, find uh, always in front of the building site uh, uh, saying uh, entry for non-professionals uh, is forbidden. Uh, so uh, I uh, am very happy that you organized 
this uh, Council of Participatory Democracy, because if you were to discuss about uh, the future of Europe, we have to discuss how the citizens and how civil society could participate in a strong uh, way in uh, this, this discussion on the future of Europe. So my point of view is that uh, we have to elaborate a kind of uh, list of cahiers de doléances to address this cahier de doléances to the European institutions. Second of all, uh, we have to clarify what does it mean to discuss about the future of Europe that is not to discuss about the European policies as they are now, but we have to discuss about which kind of competences we have to give to European Union and which kind of powers we have to give to European Union as a, a chain of command at European level. Uh, and the, the, the last point is to discuss who will take the, the power uh, to uh, this, not only to discuss about the future of Europe, but to prepare the proposals to change this Europe in a different way. From my point of view, and because I'm quite sure that this conference don't start this year, I think that we have to ask the European, view, the European Parliament to make what the European Parliament made uh, with the Spinelli Draft Treaty and to uh, uh, open the way to a kind of constituent process. So I think that if we have to address a petition to the European Parliament, that is my last word. When the European Parliament will meet for the first time after the crisis, very probably the 20th of May, I think that we have to, to, to address a petition or a, a kind of appeal to the European Parliament to take into account the reasons of the crisis related to the coronavirus and the weakness of the European Union in front of this crisis and to discuss what we have to do after this crisis to change things at European level and to open the way to the different Europe. So that is the reason because we have to put together the representative democracy that is represented if I can say this word at European level by the European Parliament and the participatory democracy uh, breaking uh, this uh, word, uh, this sentence uh, in which uh, normally the institutions say entry for non-professionals uh, is forbidden. Or co in the contrary, we have to open the doors uh, to the participation of the citizens and civil society in the discussion of the future of Europe. Thank you, Pier Virgilio. So we have the first two people that are scared to speak, and I think we let them uh, speak not included in the sessions. Uh, and then we'll see if we need to go in a um, structured approach to each session or if we keep it a bit more light with some uh, elements. I just remind for those of you who just joined that there is a link to a working document that you can update with your notes on what the others are saying or what you're gonna say. And uh, to be honest, this is really precious uh, to, to make sure that we track down appropriately everything that we discussed today. So please make the most of it. Um, so the first person I want to speak is Monica, which I guess is Monica Frassoni. Uh, Monica, introduce yourself because I know your previous title, but I don't know your new title. So I, I leave Monica to, to, to talk. Hello, no, I don't have any particular title. I'm a federalist, I'm a green, and uh, I am uh, not many other things. Anyway, I just wanted to, uh, first of all, thank you very much for this initiative. I think it's, uh, it's a very timely. Um, I also uh, wanted to uh, say a few words about what, uh, about not only what Virgilio said and proposed, but also uh, about what uh, Marco and the others said. And I have three points. First, I think that uh, one of the most important things that we have to do is to concentrate and to try to define what are the issues uh, about which we want to intervene now in this very moment um, in order to um, 
um, make sure that the understanding of uh, um, what Europe should do um, is also something related to uh, what uh, um, the people really need to hear somehow. And I will make an example. I am extremely happy, of course, uh, to see that uh, in Germany, in Italy, and in other places, uh, even here in Belgium, even if uh, we are only finishing now our, our first uh, 24 hours of uh, medium lockdown, um, there are you know initiatives of solidarity and things like that. But I think that what is really missing is the fact <coughs> of having the idea that this is part of a European strategy. And this is uh, something that we have to very much insist uh, on. <clears throat> um, and uh, I believe that uh, what the, and we have to, to define what uh, the negative aspects, for example, of this has been. Like, uh, for example, this idea that. Uh, Hello, can you hear me? I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. There was a bit of okay. So, all right. So, um, and so I think that uh, we have to concretely put, put up certain things that uh, we have to somehow sti uh, stigmatize. Example, it is completely useless to uh, close uh, internal borders. <coughs> it is unacceptable that the European Parliament doesn't meet. It is, um, you, you understand, I don't know if you understand what I mean, in the sense that there is, in this That's moment, a little, moment, bit of, um, a little bit of uh, overlap between <clears throat> policies that are, um, of course, necessary, like the lockdown, etc., and the European dimension, which is really not very clear. So I think that uh, it would be interesting to understand also from all of you what is it you believe that the European Union should do. <clears throat> and I believe that uh, uh, what Virginia expressed is certainly important and, clear and uh, interesting. <coughs> Sorry, I have something in my throat. But uh, but I think we have to be a little bit more um, granular and uh, define what we uh, what we want to propose. Thank you, Monica. So uh, I have sorry, wrong file. We have Robert Goya from w Voting Without Borders and then Sibilla Barbieri. Then, if you agree, I would uh, let the floor again to Lorenzo Marsili for a quick hint on the conference on the future of Europe. So we kind of move to the uh, sessions, but let's keep everything in mind as we progress. So Roberto Gioia, Sibilla Barbieri, and then Lorenzo Marsili. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much for having me, and thank you very much for this meeting. I express my solidarity with all of you. Uh, I'm a master's student here in Leuven in European Studies, and I'm also in the initiative of Voting Without Borders. And at our initiative, we believe that uh, political rights in the European Union should be enhanced, and here I will tell you why do I think so. It's because the liberal democracy purpose in the EU model, it works since 2009 Lisbon Treaty, but <clears throat> excuse me, but it shows lack of function functionality during crisis, as in sometimes EU has late replies and there's not enough solidarity. And uh, due to this, the European public opinion is divided. And I've noticed earlier, uh, some of you, I can't remember who exactly, but I thank you for the speech and opening up about the issues of the Eastern part of Europe, uh, and more specifically about Orban, Orban, Viktor Orban. Um, if we look at Viktor Orban, his policies are a direct res response to the migration crisis in 2014, 2015. And he did so, and he got the popularity around the European Union due to the fact that he capitalized on Eastern, Eastern frustrations uh, nationally in Hungary from the, 90, from the 1990s migration issue, uh, due to the fact that uh, during the 1990s, European solidarity was low. And due to the... Due to this fact, he he emerged himself as a political lead, leader, uh, as as a sort of a constant uh, contestation against the liberal democracy purpose in the view of the EU. Hence, he created the front against liberal democracy. 
And urban policy is also a response to the, to the demediating power of the US and the more unstable international stage. And that's also due to the fact that the EU has a hard time capitalizing on its power in the international stage. And this is a, a problem which is mostly capitalized in the entire Europe, and that is sovereignty. The combination is not a, a successful one. Sorry? Was that a reply? No, I think we'll just a mic open. So okay, okay. And I will also like to draw attention over the issue of sovereignty nowadays in the European Union because sovereignty uh, is a way to also uh, diminuate solidarity in times of crisis. It works perfectly. If we look at Brexit case, for instance, it was everything happened due to the fact that it was uh, the migration crisis going on and Brexit happened. The referendum came due to the fact that the migration crisis was an issue which the European Union had a hard time dealing with. And um, due to the fact uh, that the discourses about sovereignty mostly capitalizes on the public opinions narrative during the times of crisis, the narrative power of populism and the influence of the fake media, plus the usually late and reluctant response of the EU institutions ha has a toll on the European Union's uh, solidarity project as an EU citizen. Hence why at the uh, at uh, Voters Without Borders, we we believe that political rights in the European Union should be should be addressed, and uh, we think that this is the moment to act. And therefore, the Council of Participatory Democracy has a clear leeway to make an impact now. And here, I will like to rest my case. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. We now got Sibilla Barbieri and Fernando. Uh, just one note for everyone, after this intervention we'll go uh, through an introduction on the conference of the future of Europe. If you can all edit uh, your name in the chat, uh, adding names, surname, city where you are in, uh, and when you ask to, to talk, if you can also write down the organizations that you belong or the whatever, uh, so that we have a bit of a understanding of who is online. So Sibilla Valdieri and then Fernando uh, Chironda, if I remember correctly, and then uh, we move to the first session. Is it uh, okay? Uh, you can hear me. Um, a couple of points: um, the closure of the borders in this period um, is showing us that we that there is a serious uh, risk for uh, the european democracy in the other hand we can see that millions of people are forced to use digital media and so uh, is is a is a process that became very very quick for millions of people in everywhere and uh, so the point is uh, in which way we can turn this uh, situation in, um, in a plus, in an advantage. Uh, we activists uh, need tools and uh, um, from many documents because uh, they we received before for all these uh, organizations, uh, we see that one of the points is that uh, um, is the idea uh, to uh, use new way uh, uh, for the democracy, new way to uh, develop democracy. And so one point for me could be the request of develop an official platform that is supported from the European Parliament uh, that can use uh, this moment in which we understand how much is important uh, the digital uh, connection in, a, in a, a platform that could be the new way to discuss uh, the policy and help the European uh, democracy to don't um, uh, be destroyed to this. And also in this platform is a, a support, uh, an official support of the European Parliament. Uh, we can perhaps push about the possibility to change the treaty and to the 
um, and uh, um, support the possibility that Europea, Europe, uh, um, Europe became a really uh, um, <laughs> uh, not only an economical uh, point, but also a political point. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Sibilla. Uh, so we got Fernando, and then uh, I would ask Lorenzo Marsili first and uh, uh, Lorenzo Mineo after for the speech. So let's start with uh, Fernando, if you can introduce yourself, and then uh, you have your time. You are probably muted. Let me check. Yeah, yeah, I was muted. Sorry. Okay, cool. Can you, can you hear me now, right? Yes, yes, we can. So I was saying, my name is Fernando Chironda, and I work for Tilt. And Tilt is um, a citizen platform, a campaigning platform, which was uh, basically created by the European Games, and I'm based in Brussels. Um, well, I have just, um, I mean, I, I started for joining later, but I had a, a previous meeting that I uh, couldn't join before. And the thing that I want to share with you, in which most of uh, you also already touched in a different way, especially when it comes to the issue of coronavirus thing, I my well, I was very much surprised by seeing the European Union when it, uh, the crisis started, uh, mostly in Italy, that um, some of the countries or the border countries, uh, they were like closing uh, their own borders to avoid, which is of course in one hand understandable, but that was uh, like for me a very much big sign of this um, lack of solidarity that Monica was referring to, but also a lack of a vision of how the European Union was basically taking this as standing as European as all in a way how um, supporting each other as countries. So I think that that will be um, one of the big things that basically, at least in my perspective, was kind of shocking and to see that happening. And if you look into the kind of, you know, the feeling that I have when it comes to results of it, it's more about people feeling less uh, attached to, uh, to, 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 to the concepts of the European Union, since it seems that the issue itself was left to the country to deal with that. And I mean, I look again, Italy has an example because uh, we can see that the, the country has done a huge amount of work and the, the drastic policies to kind of um, somehow, you know, to prevent what's happening, uh, but without much of European or Europe uh, being in there somehow as well. So that's something that I think that we could also, we should, um, I mean, think about how this Europe, how can we make sure that the Europe take a stand and deal with this uh, issue in a more broader way without leaving countries alone, um, supporting with, um, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, I mean, with materials that they need, with the economic support that they need, etc. And the second point um, that I want to also kind of uh, reinforce a little bit because it also was also mentioned by yeah, by some of you is this, uh, I think the, uh, the, the issue of, you know, economic uh, support to countries or the issue of rethinking of how the EU can basically um, redesign its own um, policy in terms of economic policy. I think, and especially when this is also related somehow to uh, in some extent to what is the consequence of the next crisis that we actually are living already, which is about climate, because this we should also not forget about it. We 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 are of course dealing with the coronavirus, but at the end of the day, um, we still we can see that some of the measure that we're taking, especially in some country like in Italy, they actually in in a, in, a, in, a, in one way or another help it to kind of you know um, force people to to do something that can that can uh, be useful to 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 stop or to at least to reduce the risk. And then that means also that for me, that means also that at the end of the day, if there is a will from a European Union countries, from the European Union itself, to kind of force or drive 
with the major, uh, let's say, policies in terms of what can be done also in terms of climate, which is going to be, again, the crisis we are already facing. So something can be done in there. So I think we we can also think about something there. And again, I'm just coming in with some of my very random personal thinking about uh, all these these issues. Uh, and I'm not sure if there how much they would be useful contribution for this discussion that we are having now. But yeah, the main point for me is that we make sure that the coordination of the way how the European is dealing with the uh, with this with this crisis should be more evident and more stronger and more present and supporting each other in terms of solidarity should be one of the first things and this the issue of borders also can be something that can, should should kind of a little bit uh, scare us because it's open a door for the next discussion about okay so then we can make it we can just close our borders and then when we whenever we want and then we deal with that as we want we can we, europe shouldn't do that we should work on more solidarity way i think that's my my three, three points thank you fernando so um first of all thanks for all the people that um, made comments and speeches in this introduction which uh, uh reinstate the reason why the meeting is kind of structured in two sessions because as we see uh all the reforms and the reasoning around the instruments uh, is uh, um, connected to what should be done. So I invite uh, all the people that already spoke to add their notes into the document that Octavian is going to share, because this is going to be very helpful tonight for some readings and tomorrow for defining uh, some proposal. And uh, uh, I add one other thing, which is that if you mention some topics uh, and you feel there are people that can bring a contribution uh in terms of elaboration and definition of action feel free to invite them to join today tomorrow <coughs> if, if, they uh, if they register on uh, on the website as you did everyone then will have all available the documents the recording and everything and it's gonna help us to keep this live coordination around us to make sure that we not only talk about participatory democracy but we walk the talk of participatory democracy uh talking about participatory um, democracy i think it's a good moment for having two um overviews from lorenzo marsili from european alternatives and lorenzo mineo from humans and i don't know if jesse colsani is connected uh but um, let's try to move now from uh, uh the issues the challenges uh, uh into what is uh, available and i'm talking about european citizen initiative instru in general participatory democracy instruments at the european level and what was in the progress of preparation which was the conference on the future of europe the two lorenzo's are gonna shed some light and then let's open up the floor for all of you who sent a lot of proposals and i'm sure in your organizations you are um, working on these two matters and let's try to identify uh some angles on this uh, uh on this but let's start with lorenzo marsili on the conference on the future of europe uh a bit of a intro for preparing our conversation after yes thank you virginia uh, very rapidly uh, I, I think it's been uh indirectly mentioned in our conversation so far if until a month ago the conference on the future of europe risked appearing uh, dramatically inadequate uh, given the challenges and threats that the European Union was facing, given the urgency of uh, climate action and transforming uh, European economic policy in a way that was conducive to giving real teeth to that climate action. If the conference risked appearing inadequate back then, back in January, the risk today is that it looks downright surreal uh, confronted with what is happening in front of us. Uh, we, we know that uh, the EU is probably going to be facing over the next months an existential threat, another existential threat uh, that might probably be even greater than that of 2008 and 2010-11. Uh, we know that the level of uh, economic disruption, uh, indeed the global depression that is coming our way, uh, is going to be unprecedented. 
And we know that differently from 2008 and from 2010, this is not going to be just a financial crisis, which means the space for technical engineering around the edges to find um, avenues of intervention within the really existing European constitution, aka the multiple treaties and regulations, is going to be dramatically limited. It is not going to be enough to just pour liquidity into, into the financial markets as we, as we did through quantitative easing. We're looking at a situation of uh, uh, a crisis in the real economy requiring massive investments in the real economy itself. Even the Financial Times yesterday was advocating for double digit deficits in order to address the aftermath of the current health crisis. And we know that the structures of the European Union are not really able to, uh, to do something, something of that sort in the way that they are currently structured. What's more, we saw already back in the previous financial crisis a process of divergence between member states. We saw that um, the crisis of 2008 and then again of 2010 reinforced the diverging path between the south and the north of, of Europe, for instance. And that path of divergence uh, although with different ge geographies, would probably probably be replicated at an even greater scale today as some countries completely shut down their production system. Uh, in Italy, we know that uh, there is no production happening at all except the production of food and medicines. And this is, again, something unprecedented since the Second World War. Um, so we're faced with a, with a situation that uh, uh, that, that calls upon some pretty dramatic and drastic measures and also calls upon a certain urgency and, and, and uh, speed of action for those measures, which flies in the face of the Conference on the Future of Europe as originally planned, a long-term process that was going to look at some not so radical, ultimately, uh, transformations to the EU infrastructure. To, to, to put it in one line, when the European Union risks a breakdown and an economic crisis on a scale unprecedented since World War II, it would appear surreal to just talk about introducing transnational lists in the 2024 European elections. And this is the danger that, that we have with the conference at the moment, that uh, it loses completely uh, any relevance, and in fact it just becomes an instance of the detached, uh, of the detachment from reality of a certain Brussels bubble and, and, and European discourse. The opportunity, however, that, that this situation has is that the evidence of the inadequacy of a certain understanding of the Conference on the Future of Europe can be transformed into an asset and especially can be transformed into a great weapon for those who, like us, would like this conference to be more ambitious, to be able to address the kind of transformation that we think the EU needs and we all know that that transformation is is something quite structural and quite significant in terms of uh, aspiration size ambition of uh, of maneuver um, i think what what we are looking at is possibly uh, the, the the need of a two step or two speeds approach we know that we need critical measures immediately. We will need a lot of creativity, a lot of intervention, a lot of flexibility from the European Union over the coming months if we are to avoid this disaster being compounded by an economic disaster and then a political disaster within the European construction. And this is something that obviously is, is outside of the Conference on the Future of Europe. We need the kind of emergency decision making that we all became familiar with in the previous financial crisis. But then we also we cannot have a political system that just continues with only the kind of emergency decision making that we saw was anyway ineffective back in the in the previous crisis. We know that we need something that's more structural, something that's more institutional. We know that we need a level of, of systemic and, and sustainable transformation of European policies and structures that enable the continent to emerge strengthened and not disintegrated out of this crisis. And this is where the Conference on the Future of Europe can uh, and needs to come in. It needs to be the space where, on the side of emergency policy making, medium term transformations are thought about and some consensus around them begins to be fostered 
so that in two years time we can have concrete realistic proposals for the kind of change that we need and so our um uh, our role is probably this is is to is to explain the two different roles and the two different temporalities of emergency decision making and the conference as a medium term approach and to play within and outside of the remit of the conference on the future of Europe to make sure that it lives up to this expectation, that it lives up to the role of the longer term, more structural and sustainable space where these decisions are taken, or at least are began to be talked about, that we also need today. We need to, if you like, also save the conference from its own surreality by building up the narrative of why, especially in a moment of crisis, a conference of this kind is, is, is needed. And as we do so, as we build that new framing for what the conference's role within the context of a health crisis and a coming economic crisis is, we need to do all that we can to make sure that that's actually respected in the ongoing proceedings of the conference itself. There is nothing, nothing that would damage the idea of a democratic transformation of the European Union as much as seeing a conference that's meant to draft the Europe of the future that is completely inhabiting a different planet, planet from what hundreds of millions of citizens in quarantine and losing their job are inhabiting. And so we need to bridge that gap by doing all we can to introduce this element of urgency, of ambition, of strength, of vision within the workings of the conference. Also strengthened by, 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 by what I was saying earlier on, the idea of possibility, the idea that we are seeing that it is possible for democracies, for states, for the public to activate a, a process of very significant political, social and economic transformation in a very short span of time. And this is one such moment and the conference needs to be the space where that urgency is translated in long term visions uh, and, and possibilities of transformation. So on the one side, we need to be able to, uh, to make this argument uh, and we need to do so also again to save the conference from itself and we need to activate all that we have been discussing in our Skype calls over the last week, so all our processes of influence, of lobbying, of working within the conference, working with people who will be taking part in the conference to make sure that this relevance is maintained and that this, uh, this, this sense of mission is, is, is really developed in the process of the conference from the moment that it is going to be launched. Even the launch itself of the conference has to have a powerful rhetoric now, it has to have the type of rhetoric that competes with the address to the nation that leader after leader are giving all across European member states. Uh, I hope that we find the mechanisms uh, for doing so, and I hope that uh, within the conference there will be people ready to listen to this kind of uh, approach, uh, but also we need to be ready um, if that is not the case. We need to be ready to accept the idea that it may not be enough to just perform the usual kind of uh, soft lobbying that the uh, Brussels bubble is used at vis-a-vis uh, -vis a conference that doesn't recognize the urgency of the moment. And then perhaps we need to think of ways of challenging what is already a growing public anger towards the inadequacy of the European Union in this crisis to be propositive and not destructive. I think we need to think of ways that uh, even a certain agonism of action, a, a certain uh, protest, uh, a certain uh, forceful voice of dissatisfaction can be challenged, uh, can be channeled in a way that makes it a propositive uh, pressure on the workings of the conference itself. Uh, when we spoke over Skype a few weeks ago, we discussed the idea of uh, uh, radically pro-European democratic contestations of the conference itself. Now, this may not be the moment for contestations also because of basic questions of social containment and isolation, but I, I think we, we, we need to work on this double track. How do we influence the conference from within, given the usual lobbying mechanisms and influence mechanisms and public pressure that we're used at, and how we up our ants, how we increase the level of uh, noise that we can make as a way of, uh, of challenging this anger that is going to be coming towards us in the, near, in the near future. And in some cases, as in Italy, it is already very present. It's notable how China is getting much more favorable press in Italy than the European Union is. And we know uh, what the 
uh, president of Serbia said just a couple of days ago, very harsh words towards the European Union. This kind of uh, behavior is going to be, if anything, increased in the weeks ahead. And it's part of our duty to be able to channel that when it comes to the uh, our relation to the conference on the future of Europe. The, the, the final point um, uh, that, that I, I, I'd like to make, make, it's a very quick one, and it's this, while we uh, frame our approach to the conference, while we try to justify its existence, while we, while we try to increase its ambition, while we develop innovative ways of action to channel social protest and anger beyond lobbying, maybe we also need to think of what we can do and we need to prepare some scenarios of what we can do if this conference ends up being a lukewarm, top-down, ultimately meaningless exercise in petty politics and navel-gazing. This option is a very realistic one. Until last month, I would have said that this was going to be the most probable outcome, that in two years from now, we we'll see a completely pointless conference that at best has some fudges around the edges. Given the situation now, it might just be that something somewhat more relevant will come out of this conference, given the urgency around us. But I think there is still a pretty uh, high likelihood of this not happening and the conference failing its mission and hence failing uh, European citizens. And in this case, I just want to leave you with this provocation. It might be that the time will come um, a couple of years from now, which means that we need to start preparing that now for citizens themselves to organize institutionally and politically into an alternative citizens assembly or citizens conference on the future of Europe. This is something, and Virgilio Dastoli knows better than anybody else, that uh, has been done in the 50s by Spinelli and friends who organized the elections of a constituent assembly and more than half a million Europeans voted for it in the old analogical ways of the past. And I think it shouldn't be beyond our level of vision and ambition to at least consider the possibility that we work together creating some scenarios and plans for action that enable us in 2022, when this conference may have resulted in failure, that we call upon, construct, elect, select, randomly select an alternative citizens conference that does the job that this conference would have potentially, uh, we hope not, potentially failed to do. 2022, it's the end of the conference on the future of Europe. It's also two years before the next European elections. And that's an interesting time frame for me because we prepare for what happens after the potential failure of this conference and also create a vehicle that can influence and play a role in the next appointment of the European elections in 2024. So this is what I, I wanted to say and it's summed up in, in three points. Uh, let's frame this conference differently. The conference itself needs it now. Let's devise innovative and also agonistic ways of influencing this conference and to bring that ambition that we need within its remit. And let's think longer term of what we can do in order to substitute this conference if it, if it fails as all well as European citizens, as we hope it won't, but as we know, it is certainly possible that it will. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorenzo Marsili uh, from European Alternatives. Um, I see that there is also Jessica Olsani from The Good Lobby, so I will give the floor to Lorenzo Mineo on the um, innovation of uh, participatory democracy, uh, and then uh, which flows nicely with what Lorenzo said, and then to Jessica Olsani. So we have an overview of the tools available, the instruments, uh, and uh, in the meantime, guys, don't forget, if you want to talk, you can add your name into the chat. I already have uh, Ferdinando Dastoli signed in and uh, um, Federica Martini from CESUE. So Lorenzo Mineo and then Jessica Olsani. <clears throat> Thank you, Virginia. Uh, first of all, despite being uh, rhetorical, maybe I would like to point out the importance of this moment because we have 72, 72 peoples from uh, several uh, European countries uh, trying to discuss about uh, the reform that we need to tackle this crisis uh, through participatory democracy. So in a very difficult moment for uh, uh, all of us, this is already a very important starting point. And uh, to be honest, I think it may sound a bit uh, off topic to discuss about uh, participatory democracy tools uh, uh, in, uh, in such a healthcare crisis, uh, which uh, gets ready to be an uh, economic crisis, 
and uh, everybody is talking about uh, a major intervention of the EU just because uh, a crisis that knows no border would need a supranational intervention, uh, obviously. However, we know that uh, the power itself of the European institution uh, is not adequate, it's not up to the challenge, and we would need uh, a proper uh, reform of the treaties uh, to give more power of intervention uh, of, um, to the EU, especially in the field of uh, health care and civil protection. And these two uh, points are at the center of a petition that we will discourse, discuss uh, more in detail tomorrow. Um, but uh, now, I, I, now, probably I would like to uh, point out uh, the instrument itself of uh, participatory democracy as a tool uh, that can play uh, a crucial role in asking the EU uh, in asking for an EU intervention. Um, we know that this coronavirus emergency is uh, a, a turning point in the in the eternal debate uh, on the future of Europe. Uh, on the one hand, the pandemic brings uh, uh, with itself the risk of a nationalist fallback uh, in member states if the EU uh, response proves to be impalpable. But on the other hand, this is also an opportunity for Europe uh, to show that it exists, actually. So, since we know that the intergovernmental system, as it is now, won't reform it, uh, himself, because it would mean to, uh, we know that uh, national states have, has a very strong, have a very strong veto power, and so, it is impossible uh, to reform treaties through the intergovernmental system uh, existing nowadays. But at least what we can do as European citizens, I think, is to activate uh, democratic and participatory democratic instruments um, asking this EU uh, intervention. And, uh, uh, I know that uh, we will discuss maybe about some proposal from civil societies addressing the challenges on health care uh, that uh, EU should, uh, uh, should tackle. Uh, it would be probably even better if we can, if, if we will be able at the end of this two day meeting to frame of this proposal uh, from civil society uh, maybe Jesse that will uh, uh, talk, speak about uh, after me, uh, will introduce uh, the one uh, he's working to with uh, the good lobby. Uh, but what I, want, what I want to say is that it would be really um, uh, important to frame all the uh, initiative from civil society addressed to e EU into institutional tool that would uh, make the difference, and uh, I think that is a bit the challenge of this two days meeting to to see if all uh, all those proposals that can uh, uh, come from from this meeting can be framed into uh, a participatory democracy instrument such as a petition to the European Parliament. So um, uh, that's. I think the, the the main point of the uh, of the today meetings. Thank you, Lorenzo. Uh, so Julian was asking in the chat uh, if uh, if it's free speech or if there is a leading topic. So I just give me the opportunity to summarize what we are doing here. Uh, we are trying to frame uh, the coronavirus emergency within the existing and potential instruments of participatory democracy. Now it's going to intervene Jesse Colzani from the Good Lobby to uh, describe some of the instruments available, I guess. And then uh, uh, I ask to all of you who had uh, worked in the past months on your proposals and suggestions, both on the European Citizen Initiative, the Conference on the Future of Europe, to try to sort of filter out the work that you have done 
and try to put on the table some of your ideas in the light of the introduction that we had so far and the situation we're currently in. Uh, in terms of um, the chat, you can add your name on that and I will add it to the list of uh, participants who are going to talk. Uh, Jessica Sani from The Good Lobby. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello. I I like to add my name. Oh, one sec, Franco. I add your name. I add your name, Franco. I add your name. Okay, uh, you can all hear me, including Franco, I guess. Uh, so, first of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, Virginia, for uh, uh, Virginia and the rest of the team, of course, for organizing this uh, conference and not giving up. Uh, very important in these times. Um, so, very quickly, uh, since uh, Lorenzo mentioned what we are working on in these days at the Good Lobby, we launched a campaign just yesterday. Um, Basically, we want to ask uh, all of the 27 uh, um, ministers of health of the, um, of the EU member states uh, uh, to act on, on the coronavirus, but in a coordinated way. Uh, so doing it uh, together rather than having uh, all these different uh, uh, approaches and actions uh, uh, that are not uh, very coordinated. So we had in Italy uh, a lockdown for weeks, uh, while in Germany people were just walking in the streets uh, like nothing was really happening and then all of a sudden we have these very drastic measures that are being taken so uh, a pooling of sovereignty at the moment is uh, not so easy to envision but uh, uh, some transnational coordination is definitely the way to go and definitely a way to um, sort of solve the problem of uh, viewing the eu as uh, this uh, escape goat which is uh, uh, another major risk uh, that we're going uh, towards. So um, I won't talk too much about coronavirus, I won't actually, um, but as we initially agreed uh, for the past months, uh, we will focus rather on the, the current uh, picture um, at the EU level on participatory democracy and what are the tools that are available to civil society. Um, first of all, I get to talk often to some uh, to some MEPs, uh, some members of the parliament. I don't know if Marco can confirm this, uh, if there are other MEPs connected that can confirm this as well. But they often complain about the fact that their um, inbox, their, their email inbox, is literally like full of uh, emails coming from the industry, uh, but no emails coming from civil society and citizens. That is on one side. On the other side, we have so many citizens that are incredibly upset uh, uh, and they just voice, their voice just ends up being on some social media and uh, that's pretty much it. So this, this, this is one of the major problems, this, this great disconnection that there is. Uh, and we, we believe at the Good Lobby that there is a very strong need to, to change this narrative and need to connect the dots and to inform and demonstrate that civil society uh, can have an impact and can uh, uh, be heard by decision makers. For those who don't really know my organization very well, uh, the Good Lobby is a not-for-profit organization. Uh, our mission is to demystify and democratize the lobbying to make it accessible to civil society. So lobbying is not good, it's not bad, it's just a tool and as such should be used by everyone. Um, we do so by uh, creating unconventional organizations, unconventional collaborations, uh, notably between uh, professionals that act on a pro bono basis uh, and uh, civil society within their mission. So uh, what, are, what are the moments, the tools uh, that we, we have identified that are crucial in the EU decision-making process um, and that are available uh, for, um, for, for any citizen potentially? The first one I think it has been mentioned several times is the petition system. So being able to send a petition to the European Parliament uh, and the institutions in general. This is the first point that I think uh, this conversation could, uh, could go on and uh, a first system that could be definitely improved. Another one, which I'm not sure has been mentioned is the, the European Ombudsman, uh, which has been 
um, a quite good way to put some pressure on, uh, on decision makers, uh, uh, although it has its own uh, limitations. Uh, and a good way to, to, to strengthen uh, the, the role of the ombudsman would be yeah, to, to improve the to increase the amount of uh, budget that goes into it uh, and also to promote uh, uh, the, the role of the ombudsman in, in the EU decision-making process. Um, that's a very important one. We have then public consultations. There is another tool that uh, should also be used uh, more by civil society and citizens. DCI, uh, which I'm sure you, you all know about uh, uh, and uh, requests uh, to access information and uh, documents. These are all tools that need to be improved, but most importantly, we need to connect the dots. We need to uh, teach citizens and civil society how to use all these tools in a combined and strategic way. Um, and to, so as to create some sort of a civic infrastructure. So there are these sort of two uh, two different uh, directions that should go in parallel. The first is to uh, have citizens and civil society use these tools more so as to empower them. And the second one is to reform the existing tools and create uh, some new ones. And looking more at the big picture, uh, I would say there's a, a very problem at the moment at the EU level, which is uh, uh, most of these tools uh, are uh, used by the UN, are, are there and are made available by the EU institutions as some sort of check in the box. So it's something that is used to legitimize an action that was already taken, a decision that was already taken by the EU institutions. And it doesn't really give too much of, a, of a, uh, an initiative, uh, a right to initiative uh, to citizens. So I think. That's, uh, that's something we should think about uh, a little bit more. So not have these two tools as some sort of confirmation of something that is already existing, but rather uh, have these tools as a way to voice uh, what the citizens want in the first place. And shifting this paradigm, I think, is going to be uh, a great, one of the greatest challenges um, to fix uh, the, the EU democratic uh, deficit. Uh, that's, on my side, I don't know if anybody has some questions. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, now we have a few people that are ready to uh, talk. So I would... the next one is Michele Fiorillo from uh, Civico Europa or Civico Europa. I don't know how to pronounce it. and uh, you need to activate your phone okay so okay yeah good. uh doesn't work the cam i don't know why okay it's always like that sorry um yes first of all thanks to virginia and uh, marco and all the people they organize and allow to be all here together <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> i think so you can hear me or Yes, yes, we can. There was background noise. Uh, we are muting okay. the phone, but yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. And I think somehow uh, here is plastically demonstrated that uh, uh, democracy can work also not in person um, and also in extreme situation as uh, uh, we are now in, uh, in all Europe and maybe soon in all the world. Uh, I think somehow that could be could have been the dream of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, not the Rousseau of the Five Star Movement. In which sense? In the sense that uh, in this uh, moment you would have, if you would decide to um, to have a democracy functioning through deliberative assemblies, you would have uh, single people, individual people they would debate and deliberate in their, in their own single space, individual space, detached from the assembly somehow. But it's not true totally because also here we are interacting, right? Um, 
but some some uh, what what I am saying that because uh, somehow this is uh, the dream of the liberal uh, democratic uh, uh, paradigm of democracy, in the sense that each one could deliberate, uh, uh, look into a recta ratio, and look into the general will. That was not the paradigm of Rousseau. Of course, we know that Rousseau could be interpreted in a way as a radical democracy, but some other people interpret as totalitarian democracy, right? And we have uh, in fact, facing, facing uh, this risk nowadays. Uh, and we have the need um, to build now the infrastructure of a new possible world. We don't know what will be, someone of you already said before, what will be the outcome of this situation could be uh, any outcome. And so I think that uh, we can exploit the situation, building up uh, new infrastructure for a new era of democracy, where deliberative democracy, uh, which is not, as we know, as a definition, not just participatory democracy, uh, will go to implement, integrate representative democracy, not in opposition, but uh, as said, as an integration. So concretely, uh, is since, uh, um, when there was the threat of Brexit, not still Brexit uh, referendum done, uh, that uh, we get her with uh, Civic Europa, we get her citizens, uh, uh, testimonials, uh, famous people from Roberto Saviano to Wim Wenders, to say that uh, uh, we were facing a threat to the European project and that we need uh, finally to uh, achieve it put it in citizen at the core of the European project construction because it was clear the European Council that together with Commission, but more in the last decades, more than the Commission is the core of the real European power, was not able to accomplish the dream of Ventotene and neither the dream of Jean Monnet. I mean, neither the functionalist model was working, no? Um, and uh, somehow the idea was, and I think is the idea shared by many of us here, that we have basically to uh, build up the counter power of the citizens to the European Council, yeah, to, say, to say it short. And I think as also Lorenzo mentioned before, um, we can do it exploiting the Conference of Europe, uh, uh, the Conference of Europe moment showing uh, uh, when uh, it uh, will be organized uh, and let's see how will be organized also because how will be organized we are not sure still or maybe we can just something for the head of state at that point or they will decide to to postpone because you know the news are saying that probably the situation like this is extending for the next one or two months more right and maybe more there are models saying that until we don't have a vaccination, that will be the normal situation for almost one year. So I don't know actually how they can imagine this conference on future Europe, if not as a meeting among leaders. And so the point is how to involve citizens, if still they want to involve citizens, involve in a productive way. So we are not starting from nothing. There are our experiences. I don't know if here there is someone from Barcelona in Comun, for instance or someone working with the platform, the CDIM. Well, our comrades, uh, friends uh, in Barcelona, they experimented this uh, very advanced civic tech platform, the CDIM, which was imagined to systematize the work that was uh, made physically already and experimented already by the Indianados mo uh, movement, no? uh, assemblies in each quarter to decide together the things about the common good of the city. And then systematize uh, that these assemblies also through a, a web platform able to coordinate better the people. So it was not a substitution initially to the to the physical assemblies. But then they started also to decide that the vote was possible through the to this platform too, not only in assembly. So I give you just then a first uh, maybe proposal also for our council. Why not, for instance? to try to experimentate this deciding platform or other platform like this. Uh, in the other way, starting from the uh, virtual reality, which is also a reality, and then when it will be possible 
to make this structure that we build up virtually reality. And uh, in this platform, this is in, but it could be implemented also in other ways. And also, we can, there are many other types of this civic tech. You can have uh, consultations, you can have referenda, you can have uh, deliberative discuss, discussions, uh, form fishing like uh, deliberation, etc. Then the second thing that I, wa I wanted to outline is, uh, is uh, and that we work uh, with uh, Civic Europa, is the power of reason, the power of uh, pro proposals. So we made uh, this massive consultation uh, named We Europeans. I think it was one of the first, if not the first, at that level uh, last year, right before the European elections, um, to say to the people, uh, OK, you are not happy about Europe. So but what is your proposal, actually? And we made this consultation. We selected 10 people, auto-selected by the citizens of Europe. They uh, transnational. They deliberate on, on uh, online platform and they were then the, the, the best uh, 10 proposal best in the sense they were the most voted then by the same citizens uh, among uh, among uh, two two million of people participate in this consultation uh, were invited in the european parliament to confront their proposal together with the representative of the different uh, democratic and progressive groups uh, in an extended uh, means from uh, the European left to, uh, to, the, to the EPP, um, to confront their proposal with, with them and uh, civil society organization in a deliberative uh, format. And the outcome were not uh, so bad, I, I should say also because of the presence of the media press, etc. And that was the, a way for us to contribute like to the, deconstruct the populist nationalist narrative. Uh, now we are uh, reasoning about soft, something other, uh, which is the uh, this idea of how to use uh, um, online deliberation in a more uh, precise way. So not just consultation, but deliberation. Maybe some of, of you knows this platform named um, uh, Chialo. It's, uh, Michele, can you go through the conclusion? Because they're going to too long. So this, uh, this, I don't know if you know Chialo, but by the way, is a is a way like of reasoning, like based actually on the Platonic way to of division of concept in two. So why this? Why not? What if this? Then why? Etc. And it's quite used also in Germany by many NGOs. And it was never experimented to a transnational level. Maybe we could imagine to. To, to think to that. Uh, I, I go to the group saying that, that uh, um, uh, as said say Lorenzo and others, also Pier Virgilio, many organization, also DN25, of which I'm part of, and I'm organizing with them a campaign for a constitutional assembly. The, the idea could be also that we could crowdsource together and proposing to other citizens, crowdsource a draft of European constitution, exactly as Pinelli made. So it's not. Uh, only, we can imagine not to arrive to an auto-elected constitutional assembly, even, or an institutional one. But first, we can also fake the thing and uh, imagine how to crowdsource, of course, crowdsource an uh, European constitution in a participative way, also without a constituent assembly. In that way, we start to put the citizen in the idea that uh, at some point it will be possible and necessary to have a real constitutional assembly. And uh, yes, uh, for now it's okay. I guess. Thank you. Just one question because I saw you talking as Tommaso Campanella, but uh, you were registered as Michele Fiorillo. So yeah, this is because this is the computer of my brother, okay. and my account okay. as a joke of me uh, g gave me uh, the no, name Tommaso no Campanella. You know, this ancient philosopher it's of Renaissance. Very inclusive environment. If you are two, we can. I mean, it's okay, but good to know, Michele. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, so next person is Julian G from Volt, and uh, let's try to stick to a six-minute uh, first round, so that potentially we have space for more intervention. There is Julian, and and then Federica Martini from Cesare. Yes. Hello. Thank you very much for having me, and uh, all you European enthusiasts are really inspiring. 
Uh, I think it's really nice to be in this round and to have so much momentum behind a good cause and so, uh, social get together. Um, I heard a few times that you are, or many people are worried that uh, uh, the EU is diverging again and very, is becoming very nationalist and uh, that our tools and means in participating together and socially within the EU are not being used enough or maybe even that the European Parliament or the, uh, the, the EU doesn't offer enough um, grip for the citizens to participate in decisions. Um, concerning the Conference of Europe, uh, if you want to leverage your ideas and concepts, I don't know whether you have if whether you already have leverage into politics, but uh, I thought that's the reason I'm here today, is that uh, maybe there could be good synergy if you were to tag along on uh, about Europe's um, stance on uh, improving the Conference on the Future of Europe. I don't know whether it is known, but we have an N MP in the European Parliament, and he is trying to do more or less the same things as we are discussing here. So that's, I don't need my six minutes altogether and I don't want to do too much of uh, advertising for a political party here in this round, but uh, it might be uh, worthwhile considering using political leverage and that might be a good uh, way to go about it because he is actually trying to uh, move the conference on the future of Europe in such a way that it becomes an iterative process, very citizen near, and uh, try to include uh, everybody from all around Europe. Uh, and he himself is worried as well, our MP, that it might be a very superficial process that the Commission is at the moment uh, intending to do. And so he's trying also to fight for citizen uh, participation in that, uh, in that environment. That is all for me right now. Uh, if you have any questions, ask questions or the next speaker may carry on. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker is, uh, sorry, I lost. So thank you, Julian. We have Federica Martini from CESUE. Hello, everyone. Um, are you hearing me? Yes. Okay. Hello, everybody. First of all, thank you uh, to all of you for the invitation. Um, just a second to briefly introduce uh, not myself, but uh, CESWE, because probably you don't know what CESWE is. Um, I'm just a collaborator of CESWE. Unfortunately, the directors are um, not able to participate themselves in the meeting um, because of um, uh, universities. Uh, um, you know, stuff and meetings and exams, uh, so on. Um, so here I am. Uh, Cesare is uh, trying to do a lot of things about uh, uh, European civic education uh, at different levels. So, for example, I'm basically in charge of uh, uh, civic education with uh, young people and high school students. Uh, it is very difficult, and I want to point it out uh, because I think it is. Um, there is something that no one already said that is that European citizens commonly uh, doesn't know the EU and how the EU functions. So this is a very big problem for us. And uh, um, it is very hard <laughs> to go to classes, to schools uh, and trying to uh, explain to people and young people, young citizens, European citizens, what the EU is and how it works. Um, in these weeks, uh, for example, um, I noticed that a lot of Italian people uh, were very, very uh, upset. <laughs> with Europe and with the, uh, the European initial uh, reaction to the coronavirus emergency. And it is, you know, probably um, difficult to understand for us, but they were complaining the absence of Europe. And um, we perfectly know that the European Union uh, does not have a specific competences on 
uh, this topic and this is something that I think we should put push on our reflection uh, but uh, it, a lot of Italian people were very upset and so I, I think that this is a very complicated moment for us because we have on the one hand trying to put the, the institutional discussion on the institutional reform of the EU um, as a uh, European interest. On the other hand, we have to face um, the challenge of uh, trying to, to make people more confident and uh, trying to make people trust on uh, the European Union idea. Um, so, for example, um, one first uh, uh, very ambitious step uh, is trying to turn the conference on the future of Europe in a European convention to draft a new constitutional pact. So trying to uh, use this emergency um, to trying to be very, very ambitious. Uh, we perfectly know that uh, we have a lot of problem on um, how the EU is currently working, um, especially uh, due to unanimity process and um, the veto rights. But we have to uh, use this um, occasion, uh, this very sad and um, thread occasion to say that uh, the EU is just, uh, let's say, uh, an incomplete re respublica, respublica. And so uh, we have to make uh, it complete. Uh, we have to make a, a truly, you know, like federal framework of the uh, European institutions. Um, I think that uh, tomorrow will be the best uh, moment to uh, briefly explain you um, an appeal that has, has been launched by CESUE, which is uh, a European answer to the coronavirus threat to prove that the EU is a true community with a shared future. So the point of the shared future, according to me, according to us, is uh, crucial. And uh, this is the moment to be very, very ambitious with our um, proposal. So uh, we, we really think that it is the time to say that we need another EU, a different EU, and to ask for a truly convention to, uh, to make a constitutional path because we need it. And the very, the most important probably thing that coronavirus virus is um, uh, trying to say to us is that since uh, we have no borders, uh, we really need at least as European to have a uh, political uh, unity and uh, also political powers. Thank you, Federica. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> sorry. The next person is Pier Virgilio Dastoli for our second round. Then there was Tommaso Campanella, which I guess was Michele. Then we have Roberto Goria for a second one. And then Tommaso, Pochi, Marco Carpato, Iga Camoca. Uh, Pier Virgilio Dastoli, I put the link yes. below that. You are speaking a lot about uh, the European Conference, but for the moment, uh, uh, the European Conference, as I said, is a kind of an unidentified flying object. We don't know, there is no agreement about the mandate, there is no agreement about the composition, there is no agreement about the conference, the governance, there is no agreement about the outcome. Uh, so uh, I'm not so sure that we have to invest uh, a lot of time, a lot of intellectual uh, activities and contribution of this conference. This conference is a conference without a uh, democratic uh, accountability and the conference is not is uh, without the capacity to deliver. So uh, my opinion is that if, uh, if we have to be ambitious, we have to think about another method, another way. Uh, Lorenzo Marcini spoke about the European People Congress. Uh, between 56 uh, to 62, but the European People Conference was uh, imaginated by Altiero uh, Spinelli in a moment in which the European Parliament was not elected, and that means uh, in a, a moment in which the European Parliament was not democratically representing uh, the European citizens. 
So if you have to think about uh, the constituent assembly, we have to think about the, our action uh, uh, to move towards the European Parliament, to ask the European Parliament to assume this uh, constituent uh, responsibility. The convention, as you know, because that was the case for the convention the chaired by Giscard, is a body uh, that have to uh, decide by a consensus and that the recommendation of the convention has to have to be submitted to a, an intergovernmental conference adopted by unanimity and submitted to the unanimity of the national ratifications. So my opinion is not that the, the method of the convention, even if we, we can uh, uh, name it uh, constituent convention, is not an efficient and democratic way. We have to think about another way. So I'm not so sure that after the virus crisis, the government will reopen the way to the European conference uh, proposed by Emmanuel Macron, Emmanuel Macron last year. I'm not so sure. Uh, if you see the priorities of the German presidency, the uh, European conference is not inserted in the German priorities. So I'm not so sure that this conference will start this year. So I think that the, in front of the crisis of Europe, we have to uh, move, as I said, towards the European Parliament, ask the European Parliament to assume this responsibility. It's the only way to be so ambitious, it's the only way to open the way to change Europe. If we think to other methods, the convention of the conference, we think of, about methods that are not democratic and not efficient. So I ask you to think carefully about this question. As I said, the conference is without democratic accountability and without capacity to deliver. It's not the, the best way to reform the Union. Thank you, Pier Virgilio, for adding this uh, perspective and also remark on the conference on the future of Europe, which is something we need to tackle in, in a specific way, as combining your approach and uh, Lorenzo. Uh, now we have so Robert Goya, who is for the second intervention, so I recommend to keep it uh, a bit short. Then Tommaso Pochi, Iga Kamoczka, Marco Cappato, Simona Bonfante, Leonardo Zacquini. So Robert Goya on stage. Thank you. Can you hear me? <clears throat> um, okay. Um, so, yeah. Okay, good. I would like to make an intervention about uh, keeping the past to the past. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, we should address. Uh, we, we should address the current crisis not not only to understand our present situation. I mean, it's like we should address the past not only to understand our present situation, but also the likely future outcome. And by this, I mean that after the coronavirus outbreak, the current stock market, the current economic situation all around the world points to a recession, which is likely. That doesn't mean it will actually happen. So we have to be honest, after these, this crisis or the two crises, the EU highly likely will have a legitimacy crisis after the lockdown is over. And this points to the question that, how will the EU demonstrate its legitimacy after? And here, I would like to endorse Federica's constitutional reform call, but in the meantime, this should be shaped and legitimized for the public opinion. Uh, Virgilio has a point that this conference cannot deliver, but it can demand though, uh, as this is one of the most defining moments for the EU at the moment. The role of ours should be to enhance the EU as a bastion of liberal democracy in the eyes of the public opinion by demanding these reforms. So I believe it to be the only way that the EU can actually survive after this legitimacy crisis, hence why reform now and in the future should be very well taught. And it is the only way to put the EU on the spot with citizens' demands, because uh, the, one of the main critici criticisms for uh, the EU in the public opinion is that it fails to reach um, the the EU citizen. From an administrative point of view, if you look at it, the online environment provides the perfect reasoning for participatory democracy. 
And participatory, I am sorry for this. Hopefully you don't hear the car outside, but I live next to your main street. So from, a, from an administrative point of view, the online environment provides perfect reasoning for participatory democracy. And platforms have been implemented in many, many European citizens. They address the exact needs of the residents. And to some degree, it leaves the development process in the hand of the involved citizen rather than to the appoint, appointed mayor. And this can legitimize a participatory democracy platform at the EU level. So uh, this is where I stand. And this is where I would like to draw your attention over the European diaspora, especially uh abroad and hence why uh one of our uh, main priorities for myself especially is the fact that we need the european di diaspora to be more involved in the politics of a host country host european country by demanding uh the eu to make a call to allow the european citizens regardless of their nation their european nationality to vote in the referendums of the eu because this is the only way we can enhance further integration and by enhancing further integration we have uh further european solidarity in likely future crisis thank you very much thank you very much robert uh, next one is Sorry, I keep mixing the files. Tommaso Pochi, and then Iga Kamotka, who will of course correct my horrible pronunciation. Tommaso. Yeah, good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so um, good afternoon. I'm Tommaso Pochi, a special research fellow at uh, Hu Chao University in China and uh, teaching assistant at Luis Guido Carli and PhD candidate at Marconi University in Rome. Um, I would like to spend only a few words um, talking about the possible impact of COVID-19 on the EU and uh, more specifically in Italy and particularly from a political point of view and the relations between Italy and the European Union in the next future. Um, as we know, um, as you, many of you mentioned, we, we should identify uh, COVID-19 as a breaking element between the existing Europe and the future one. Uh, a future change in the European Union and international relations is not only probable, but uh, in, we know it's sure in the next future. <clears throat> so um, there are two possible directions. Uh, on one hand, a structural reform of the European Union and uh, a closer union and uh, a stricter uh, representative democracy as uh, the, the main issue of this uh, conference. Um, and uh, on the other side, uh, of course, we have the extinction of the EU itself. Um, I would like to focus on the Italian case because uh, at the present time it clearly represents uh, the most advanced and serious case in the first test bench for the solidity of the European Union. Um, we know that uh, European Union institutions um, have been perceived as very distant from the needs of Italian and in general European citizens in, in, in the last years, but particularly in this moment, um, the European Union idea worsened in a collective imaginary uh, and COVID-19 uh, risks to give the coup de grâce, coup de grâce uh, to this situation, um, situation like President Lagarde's statements or the block of medical supplies uh, from Germany and other countries to Italy or uh, also the suspension of Schengen agreements. Uh, all these elements are very important and uh, could um, create a, a very risky situation. Um, so it, this has depended also by um, a lack in... Uh, non fumare, fa male fumare. Sorry? It was talking with me, no worries. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, a lack of, um, so, <laughs> okay. Um, in any case, um, it is necessary to understand which uh, will be the real impact of COVID-19 uh, on national and global economics uh, um, because it's important before uh, doing any 
possible provision on the future of the European Union. Uh, so um, I think that this could be quite extreme, but I think that a general negative trend uh, uh, could be in general for all European countries, all member states, could be uh, dramatic uh, and uh, seem to be an element of weakening for the European Union. But at the same time, this could be, on the contrary, this could represent a positive aggregation element between member states and uh, uh, people in Europe. Um, so um, it's bound, but uh, in Italy we used to say uh, misery loves company, Marco uh, Mezzo Gaudio, a general negative trend in European economies uh, could improve a sense of cohesion and community between member states and their peoples. And at the same time, uh, it could force the, the institutions like in, in the last uh, one or two days to an integrated approach to the global problem. Uh, so um, massive measures to relaunch the European economy would be necessary for the entire Union and uh, um, I believe that this could represent the best way to improve a stricter cohesion integration and the higher participation uh, of member states and um, citizens of member states. So the, the sharing of difficulties in this moment is fundamental to theorize and propose a plan of reform of the EU political system and to implement a representative democracy. Uh, on the other side, if we don't have uh, such an approach, um, a financial disaster in uh, only one, two or three member states would continue to represent only a problem for that countries and only for that countries and not for the entire European Union. Uh, so um, financial flexibility and measures uh, this kind would be considered only a grant uh, almost an almsgiving by the EU to these disadvantaged states, member states. And uh, for this reason, the consequence could be, uh, there could also be uh, holds uh, against these countries in future moments. And um, so a similar situation would only have the effect to improve the, an idea of a stepmother European Union and uh, to improve uh, at the same time the centrifugal forces uh, speeding up the collapse of the European Union itself. Um, so, um, from these elements and from the, the institution, the approach of the institutions uh, and um, their communication, because communication is very important in this moment, will depend on the future of the European Union and um, the main element which characterized the, the EU in the last decade have been set aside, as we know. So financial stability, the ESM, measures of control, integration and markets, um, all of this uh, suddenly became, became obsolete uh, because of the emergency and the primacy of human life and health values on economics. Uh, at the same time, this could be uh, could offer food for thought because it clearly uh, distinguishes us as Europeans by other peoples and forms of state. Uh, for Brussels and the European institutions, it is fundamental to be accountable and credible uh, from this point of view, particularly in this moment, and to expand the concept uh, as uh, this primacy of uh, human life and health on other side, other, other uh, issues um, should be the, the, certainly the, considered the keyword for the next future, uh, even in order to improve the, the cohesion between citizens. Um, so uh, I think that uh, this is very important uh, uh, because um, otherwise the majority of people will almost certainly consider the European Union as a more uh, a mere superstructure composed of bureaucrats and bankers. So this is not my opinion, but I'm trying to interpret the, the common feeling. Uh, so um, with no sense of community and no interest for citizens. Um, first, this could happen in Italy, uh, which now represents the third economy and the third country for representatives in the EU. and. Um, but it could happen in uh, all the other states and um, it is quite probable that the European Union won't survive to uh, an Italian exit.
they can call it in this way. So I think um, that's all. Thank you very much. And uh, that's all. Thank you, Tommaso. Thank you very much. Um, so the next person is Iga Kamokka, which I will stop to say previous surname. So if you can please correct me, I will be more confident. Uh, uh, hello, that's uh, me. Well, actually, you did it quite well. Uh, it's it's Iga Kamotska. Uh, can you hear me, guys? Can you hear me, guys? Yes, we can. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so, um, well, I've got the information about today's meeting and tomorrow's just yesterday. So I'm sorry, I'm not really perfectly prepared. Um, but I looked into the materials that you prepared, uh, and well, great job, really. Thank you for that. Uh, we also love the petition uh, petition that, that you prepared, and we'll be really glad to to support it uh, and promote here uh, here in Poland. Yes, I am from Warsaw, from Poland. Uh, I work. I represent the um, uh, Polish Robert Schumann Foundation. Uh, it's a, a civil society organization. We, we mainly um, we mainly contribute to European education in Poland, and not only in Poland, um, and civic education. Uh, so these are two fields um, that we are uh, working in. Um, and actually, what I want to say already was said by a few uh, by. Uh, by, by few persons. Uh, also, um, Federica a few minutes ago um, underlined some some things. But what I wanted to uh, what I wanted to uh, to say, well, um, concerning the conference on the future of the European Union, um, I think it will be really challenging. As well, average citizens, well, they often do not want to participate. Uh, they're not eager to um, uh, to to discuss well any well European topics. They're not interested in that, and they do not have big knowledge about the EU and the well competences and possibilities of reforming. Uh, it's really a high level discussion. Um, it's uh, really a challenge to engage them. It's really easy to engage us, yeah, because we're well the the European activists. So um, uh, uh, the, the the well the European federalists, um, but uh, we're not representing the whole society as well. Yeah. Um, what is crucial for me? It's also what Federica said earlier. It is education, European education of, of citizens. Uh, we do that. I think we're really good at it, but we will um, not uh, do the whole job. We think that the examples from the European institutions is needed. Um, changing in the uh, obligatory curriculum at schools, it's needed because we can make great workshops, but we will not, you know, reach each citizen with a huge um, educative program. Uh, and so I think uh, cooperation between the education systems in the field of European education and uh, um, uh, about what 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 is the general project about? It's uh, it's really needed. Uh, and actually, stepping to this point to the point of the coronavirus, actually, I think that the coronavirus crisis has shown really beautifully that when people have small knowledge on the European Union, they really believe to the fake news that they can meet in media. Because uh, I don't know what, how was it in your countries, but in Poland, a, a lot of fake, uh, 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 fake news were available in social media and they were spread really nicely. Uh, some, of the fa some of the fake news were, uh, were produced by, um, by Russian propaganda. Mm, and uh, uh, if people are scared uh, and, and the attitude is, more or less negative it's really easy to believe in those fake news they some of them also concern the european union and that we, the european union doesn't do anything and it's the eu's fault fault um and uh, uh, it's it was a smaller small picture not not uh, not a big one um so um i think that uh, what um what what we can do um well the coronavirus already happened and i think that we can make um um use it as a chance so let's think of a chance okay it happened how can we uh, how can we use it in our uh, well to promote our our idea um so uh it's good actually i really like that you um that you added this this topic to the um, this topic to the agenda as uh, well the crisis shows that the enhanced integration is needed and we can strongly communicate that to our recipients, families, friends, depending on who you have, uh, uh, who you have uh, in um, well in your uh, in your font. Um, 
uh, we actually already started started to communicating that um, well and also show the fake news which are created concerning the EU and coronavirus and and, um, um, and tell what is, what is the real truth uh, what the EU why is EU not doing something what what they can do so I would see an educative role on uh, um, on uh, uh, on us yes um, and also uh, and we can somehow uh, we can somehow maybe try to uh, try to animate it and cooperate in this field we for example created a podcast about that um, uh, well it's in Polish so sorry but but I can share it with you, but I think it's useless. Uh, and and we prepare some materials. We also have a, a, a group, Keyboard Warriors, which their main aim is to find fake news about well the European Union, and not only well generally in a public a public debate, and to uh, really write what is the truth. So find the fake and react with the with the true information. And also, uh, as it was nicely mentioned before, um, well use our members of the European Parliament. Uh, to educate and to um, to explain the situation. Uh, well, I don't know what's your uh, what's your experience. Well, from my experience, it's well the, the member of the European Parliament is the easiest person to reach uh, in the European Union. Well, we're not a professional lobbyist, but uh, if, uh, but for us it was uh, really the easiest. Well, we didn't actually prepare petitions to the European Parliament, but uh, reaching members of the European Parliament is relatively quite easy. Um, so that's, uh, I think that's the things that I would like, wanted to say that were not said earlier. And I also have to mention, I'm sorry, I, I was supposed to leave half an hour ago, but I couldn't. <laughs> uh, wow. But I have to leave in a few minutes. I will join you tomorrow uh, and I will read, uh, you know, read up uh, the lovely, um, the lovely relation that is on, um, uh, on the common uh, docs. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Iga. Thanks a lot. And uh, so just to summarize for everyone, we have uh, 70, 63 people connected on the GoToMeeting and a few people following on Facebook and YouTube. And <coughs> we are circulating the document again in the chat where we are trying to track down all the intervention. Octavian is, Lazia is typing like crazy. So if anyone wants to help him to, to take the notes, I think it's going to be easier than to um recap what we are discussing in the light of the sessions and conclusions of tomorrow. We have now Marco Cappato for an intervention, which I don't know if it's correct in English as a word, but Marco Cappato, Simona Pontante, okay. Leonardo Zacqui, and, uh, and Nicola Milanese after that. Okay, grazie Virginia. Just for um, some uh, quick proposal. First of all, uh, what um, Virginia was saying about the conference on the future of Europe is uh, for sure true. We don't even know if uh, they will be able to convene it uh, at, the, at, the, at the date that was uh, decided, so the, the uh, 9 of, Mar of, um, of, of May in Dubrovnik. Um, I think that what we could do is to already decide that uh, whether or not uh, the official conference will be convened we will convene uh, a conference like a civil society conference or a, a self-convened conference um, in, in both cases uh, if the conference will be convened of course but also if uh, it will not be convened so um, to have a sort of uh, uh, self-convened occasion of uh, discussing the things that are, we are discussing now with uh, um, much more uh, organization uh, around Europe uh, involved. Um, the other thing that I wanted to, use, to say as a, as a bridge with the debate of tomorrow is that uh, the best reform for democracy is to use it, or at least uh, the best uh, first step to reform democracy is to use it. So I think that even if petition, for example, is a very uh, feeble, is a very weak tool, um, if we use uh, the fact of using it in order to make proposal, to try to address the current crisis is a way uh, um, to, to strengthen it. 
to try to strengthen the tool also, not just to make some proposal. Uh, because uh, to use a democratic tool contributes to reinforce the knowledge um, of the people of this specific tool. And uh, um, another concrete proposal that I think could uh, unite um, together many different organizations is to ask for information on participatory democracy, the right for European citizens to be informed when, for example, a European citizen initiative is going on or when uh, and which the petition uh, currently uh, under, uh, under the possibility of signature are. So, in a way, um, we made some research with the Simona Bonfante and uh, a few tens of millions of euros are spent in the occasion of European election to make advertisement uh, to inform the people about the election. So why people should not be informed about participatory democracy? I think we could uh, unite ourselves proposing to the European Commission an amendment to the EU budget uh, on, uh, the, on the knowledge, uh, on um, information campaign on participatory democracy. Um, at the same time, uh, I think that another very important thing that uh, Virgilio said at the beginning is about budgetary reform. Uh, there is no, is not even needed to um, to reform the treaties, well, I think that treaties should be reformed, but it's not even needed to reform the treaties in order to uh, ask for a much uh, uh, bigger budget uh, for the European Union. And for example, this could be um, created through um, carbon pricing or a carbon tax, uh, we will discuss this tomorrow um, on uh, environmental politics, but um, even discussing the crisis currently going on, it's clear that there is a budget problem, and so um, this is one of the key issues that we should address, for example, uh, in uh, the next meeting before the beginning on the, of the conference on the future of Europe, if the conference will be convened. Um, a last thing and the last proposal, uh, if they will decide to suspend the meetings of the European Parliament, I think we should uh, uh, unite our voice against that, asking for an extraordinary meeting of the uh, Parliament, even in teleconference, if uh, uh, security and, sa and uh, safety uh, will not be guaranteed. Um, but we cannot accept that uh, uh, government are legitimized to, to take very important decision in teleconference, in video conference, in secret meetings, because the meeting of, of Monday, for example, of last Monday, was as every meeting of, of the council was a secret meeting and the only public debate institution um, is, uh, uh, is is shut down is impeded to uh, to 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 convene to debate and uh, to take a decision and i think also is important um, again what virgilio was saying about uh, trying to ask the European Parliament transforming itself in the uh, constituent body for uh, the reform of the treaties. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. We have uh, some comments in the chat that you guys, you can add to the notes of Marco's speech in the document, so we keep stuff organized. And now we have Simona Bonfante, and then Leonello Zacquini, and then Nicola Milanese. Yeah, hi. Um, I'd like to address um, an issue which is quite urgent, despite it's not completely 
uh, uh, in line with uh, what we are talking about now. But I think it's a matter of ours, and it has to do with our fundamental liberties. Because since yesterday, authorities in Italy are envisaging further, more severe restrictions to people movement, despite actually most of people are compliant with the lockdown already, already um, active. The point is that the virus here in Italy is dramatically spreading and the hospitals are collapsing. So if this is happening, it's not because people are doing bad things, but because in the last years, a bad health service planning and management was done by the authorities. Now, both national and local governments are panicking. And in the next couple of days, probably hours, they may decide to impose further authoritarian sanctions um, and restrictions, such as total curfew or restrictions on food shops, opening hours, or even a total prohibition on people going out jogging. Now, this state of emergency in, in Italy is making normal the anormality of a paternalistic authoritarian government, which in my view is just strengthening the idea of the illiberal state by Orban and friends. Actually, only few people, but some, but few people in Italy are raising their voice against this growing state of police. In other countries around Europe, maybe it is still too early for people to realize how, how violent it can be living for weeks, maybe months, in home jail and be forbidden to take independent decisions as adult, responsible citizens. Now, I'm not sure actually we can feel happy with this happening in Europe with European Union permission or consent or even uh, approval. Maybe, just to remind what Monica was saying before, maybe if there's something we can ask right now to the European Union to do, I mean, really, right now, because it's a matter of hours here in Italy, is to undertake urgent actions to prevent member states from breaking European citizens' fundamental freedoms and rights, such as excessive authoritarian measures, which are not really due to the disease management, but only to the mismanagement of national health systems or a lack of European management, as actually suggested by Pier Virgilio. An urgent petition, maybe, to the European Parliament could be submitted by tomorrow by all of us. So all the organizations supporting this initiative and all people who are taking part to this council or even an appeal, I don't know, whatever, whatever, whatever mean can be considered more effective, but it has to be urgent in my view, because it, it could also actually be signed by a few personalities who, especially in Italy, are starting you know, writing about the, uh, the risk, the danger for the European democracy of such an authoritarian response. I just actually wanted to leave this topic to your consideration because in my view, it is today the topic. Thanks. Thank you, Simona Bonfante. Uh, we have Leonello Zacquino from Più Democrazia Italia. And uh, when he finishes, we will close the subscription to, to speak so that we are sure we have enough time until six for everyone. So um, if you want to, to talk, uh, just let us know so that we have a clear idea of what's going to happen for the next hour and a half that was planned. Leonello. No, actually, we will close. Sorry, I will, will close the intervention to speak after Nicolò Milanese, who is going to introduce us to the topic of the treaties. So let's have Leonello Nicolò, and then we close the intervention so that we have the input from uh, uh, Nicolò. Yes, Rapparola. 
Leonello Zacquini, Franco Levi, ti aggiungo. Leonello, if you can talk, talk. Leonello, you have to switch on your microphone. Okay. Switch on your microphone. Okay. Non ci sentiamo. No, um, can you check? Uh, puoi controllare? Sorry, one second. Puoi controllare se sei connesso le impostazioni dell'audio. Non ti sentiamo. Non ti sentiamo. Devi modificare. Ascoltami. Devi modificare le impostazioni dell'audio, probabilmente. Se vai nella finestrella dove c'è la chat, c'è una ghiera in alto, una forma di dito qualcosa. Non lo vede. Allora, intanto farei inter uh, sorry. In the meantime, if Nicolò Milanese wants to take a bit what we said so far and lead us to the treaty changes element, which is the last bit of the triangle that we are discussing today. Uh, and then we have uh, some minutes for more requests to speak, uh, if you guys want to. In the meantime, we'll check with Leonardo if he can connect. Okay, thanks, Virginia. Um, so I'm going to speak very briefly because it's a long call. Um, I think that in the moments of confusion and um, crisis like we're in, it's important for actors like us to be clear about what we will demand once the crisis and confusion is finished, because uh, this is our chance while we're all stuck at home to think about exactly what it is we want to demand while um, the politicians and others are busy dealing with an emergency. So when it comes to treaty change, I have noted down five things which would be on my list uh, um, right now. So the first one is, is related to what we've been talking about a lot, the coronavirus, and I think that uh, calling for some elements of um, health policy to be inside of European competences uh, is a very clear thing to call for these days. Um, and people have pointed out that the lack of a coordinated response inside of Europe is undermining the responses of the different countries and leading to populist kind of measures um, being taken. So I think that European competences in health, or we could call it well-being, or if they really want to, we could call it protecting a European way of life, uh, which I think in the current context takes on a new meaning as a kind of uh, title. The second thing that I would suggest um, is again related to the current situation. Uh, it's that again, we have seen that Euro the European Union's response to a crisis is to close its external borders. Whether it's to close the external borders to um, migrants and asylum seekers, or it's to say, for example, that it won't send uh, medical supplies to uh, nearby countries like Serbia because it needs them inside of the European Union. I think each of these kinds of reactions is self-defeating. Um, it's self-defeating um, in the context of a health emergency uh, to only um, dedicate resources to people inside of the European Union borders um, when we've seen that these things spread across borders very naturally. So in a treaty reform situation, there needs to be a rebalance of the way the European Union deals with its internal affairs and its external affairs to get rid of this tendency that each time there's a crisis, the European Union reinforces its external borders, which I think is self-defeating. The third thing I would uh, put on my list is related to uh, the economy, which has been, um, which has already been mentioned. Uh, I think the call for euro bonds is now uh, potentially very powerful. It, it should already have been powerful following the financial crisis, uh, but in the context of rebuilding a European economy uh, very badly damaged uh, 
uh, both by financial crisis and then even further by uh, a health crisis, um, euro bonds, and ensuring uh, that the European Union can deal with asymmetric shocks um, is something which uh, more could be done about in the context of the current treaties, but reforming the treaties would clearly be a good idea. So that's the third uh, item. The fourth item is about the European Union having uh, more care to protect the most vulnerable workers um, in the European economy. Uh, and I think that's related to the social pillar. It's very noticeable in the financial crisis, but now again in the health crisis, that some people, uh, pe managers, people who are who are, have got better jobs, are much better protected um, inside of Europe than people who are in other kinds of jobs, uh, typically lower paid kind of jobs. And I think that the European Union uh, should address this issue of equality, um, notably between its workers. So that's something about the social pillar. Um, and then the fifth area I would address is democratic reinforcement, to say that the European Union's distinctive response um, to uh, crisis is always to insist, should be always to insist, on a democratic means of response. Um, and so that means things like what Marco was talking about, no secret meetings in which uh, decisions are taken, which have massive implications for millions and millions of people. Um, reinforcement of fundamental rights and these kinds of things. So those would be my five chapters of uh, democratic treaty change, which I think that we should be insisting on already uh, so that we get ahead of the game this time, uh, rather than waiting until the crisis is, is worse or the crisis is over, because um, that time will be will be coming to the party late. We should be should be making these claims now. Those are my five suggestions. Thank you, Nicolò Milanese, for the perspective and structured introduction to the last bit of our afternoon. Um, so we do have uh, uh, Leonardo Zacquini. We are calling him to try to help him to connect. Uh, and we have Antonio Argenziano, uh, secret, um, secretary of the, how do you say it in English, Antonio? You can introduce yourself, it's easier. Juventù Federalista Europea. Yes, exactly, exactly. It's the Young European Federalists. But the, the Italian section, of course. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, Actually, I just want to add a few things. I basically agree on most of what's what's been said till now. And um, first, one thing: um, the during the last intervention, it was mentioned, it was mentioned the um, uh, the reaction uh, uh, facing the the crisis from the, the from the European Union. And I think that. Uh, Actually, this is one of the most important things, was most important news uh, we have to acknowledge in the last decade, I guess. Because usually the European integration went from a crisis to another and the, the steps uh, going forward were uh, to solve a specific crisis. Instead, uh, since the Libona um, Treaty, we are going in a, in a way backward because uh, every crisis is more uh, threatened with security measures and mostly the intergovernative systems are going to be reinforced, are being reinforced. The old, all, always the intergovernmental intergovernmental inter solution are uh, chosen above the uh, communitarian solution and this is a huge problem we are facing now. And this is one of the reasons why it's important to say that uh, basically what is not working right now is not the European Union itself, it's the intergovernmental inter govern uh, system within, within it. Uh, facing the coronavirus, we, in the last days we, uh, we've seen the European Commission reacting in a way uh, with uh, public declarations and uh, funds the European Central Bank reacting and uh, with funds and etc. And on the other end, the Eurogroup meeting was a complete, uh, it, it, it took no decision at all. 
uh, and even if we are facing one of the biggest crises uh, since the Second World War. So starting from this, uh, when we talk about uh, this crisis, I think it's uh, it's very important to be detached also by the status quo situation. We have to be cri to criticize the status quo, not to uh, disqualify the European Union, but to say that the European Union can and must be better than it is. Otherwise, if we just uh, try to defend uh, some of this mechanism that is that has, that that have a, a lot of problems, as we all know, as we all said, uh, it's going to be just an assist for who want just to destroy everything. Uh, said that, I think that one of the most important thing we have to reflect about, uh, also in in the perspective of, of the conference, is um, a reflection about the European public goods, because this is a, um, a a possible way also to address messages to the European people. Uh, when we talk about the Green Deal, when we talk about migration uh, reforms and funds, when we talk about, uh, I don't know, um, unemployment insurance at European level and etc., on the, all these kinds of investment, these are the measures that European people are actually asking about. And uh, we have to act to uh, add to uh, gain support to, uh, for the European Union to face this kind of uh, of things in order and to also of course propose a solution. The, the solution has to be that we need European resources to create European public goods. In this sense, we can tackle the European budget discussion in, uh, at first point. Of course, the European uh, there are no agreements about, about the new European budget, but we have to we all have to face this problem. One thing is we could say also that it, it should be uh, connected to the political mandate of the Commission and not being um, uh, and not lasting seven years as it is now. And on the other end, that should the, the, the resources has to be increased. The resources has to be increased not with uh, national uh, uh, contributes, but with European own resources. So uh, basically, European taxation, uh, and of course, this taxation does not have to increase the um, all amount of taxes. Uh, the, the weight of taxes on the European citizens, but it has to be a sort of reconsideration of the whole taxes system in uh, within Europe, and this, this could be also a way to tackle some of the um, fiscal havens that we have within the European Union. So I think that this could be a very important topic to to tackle, to gain support for reforms of the European Union, and we have to consider two, uh, at least two kind of time when we are talking about reforms. Once we have to face emergencies, and we have to to to, to do it, uh, and it's, it is a necessity because if we not, if we do not show results, if we do not face challenges, we are going to lose all the consensus, all the political consensus the, that the European Union. Uh, has, for example, in Italy, that the it Italy has been always a, a very pro-European country, but now the consensus for the European Union is uh, getting lower and lower. So we have to respond to answer to these emergencies, but with a long time perspective, and the long time perspective has to be a, basically a constitutional reform of the of the European Union. But I say it uh, in a federalist way, but at least we have to. Uh, put on the table the necessity to reform the treaties once we uh, we face all these emergencies we are living in and of course in this medium long time reasoning the conference of the future of Europe possibly could be the way to uh, to mobilitate all the European civil society in order to asking for European public goods and a, a democratic reform of the European Union. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonio. And uh, I'm going to read the last names that we got uh, mm -hmm. on the list. So we have Leonel Zacquino, who is going to um, try again. Then Franco Levi, Samuele Nannoni from Oderal, and Massimo Iviano Nespola. 
and uh, we have one hour a quote Hello. Hello. I try to speak with you. If you understand. Yes, we do. It's okay. Okay. I go. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, um, I deactivated the browser because it was inserted before. Uh, uh, I I thank you very much for this meeting. This is very 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 interesting. And thank you also for putting uh, in the list of the document uh, a document. Uh, 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 of uh, Più Democrazia Italia. Uh, this document I have just pointed out. There's the document that you put in the list um, at the bottom of your list, the, the, all the other documents, uh, as is something uh, or uh, old document. Uh, we wrote it uh, some year ago, and uh, certainly we have to uh, uh, update it, uh, even with the uh, result of this uh, um, uh, meeting uh, and the more recent consideration, uh, uh, recently appeared uh, for the sanitary problems. Uh, nevertheless, this uh, document is a basis for uh, our consideration. Um, I would like just shortly just add some uh, uh, comments uh, related in particular to the fact uh, that uh, I feel uh, and we feel that uh, uh, the, uh, Europe and Switzerland we are living are something that are strange but it's similar. It means that uh, Switzerland is a small country but we could take it just like a, 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 a kind of small prototype of uh, uh, what Europe could do. The first consideration that we have to do is that we are speaking a lot about uh, uh, participatory democracy and uh, we have not to make confusion between participatory democracy and direct democracy. They are two different uh, structure and tools for democracy. Both are very, very important, but they are different. In general, participatory democracy uh, uh, is not uh, deciding something. It's just advisory. advisory. Uh, obligatory tools, nevertheless, are related to direct democracy. And uh, we have uh, our, our different structure, structure are very important. Both the, 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 the tools are very important. Therefore, for, for, for instance, we, if we are speaking about uh, citizens' assembly, they are typically, typically participatory uh, democracy that uh, do, uh, offer information in two sense, uh, in two directions, uh, but it's not typically not deciding. But nevertheless, we had and we have to think how to do it, uh, how to combine uh, 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 and how to associate to uh, the uh, citizens' uh, assemblies uh, at the end of, of the process, how to uh, call to a votation of the uh, full population in order to take the good decision, to, uh, uh, to, to take obligatory uh, decision. It's uh, uh, a study on uh, tools that uh, it's very delicate, it's very important. Uh, I, am, I, I think that it's important that we consider the, uh, the three aspects of the democracy. Therefore, the representative democracy that uh, in, uh, in Europe is just a, a bit having uh, 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 having problems because uh, the parliament is not uh, uh, having the power that the, the typical of the, uh, the of a parliament, the European Parliament uh, is uh, uh, is not that uh, uh, concerned in uh, in in deciding laws and so on. 
and then making difference between participatory democracy, that's very, very important also, and direct democracy, therefore, how to combine uh, the, the, the discussion, the, the, the exchange of information with uh, uh, decision. Is not this uh, the moment uh, in order to, to, to define these uh, important details, but uh, uh, I, uh, I will uh, contribute uh, with the experience that, that, that I am living here in Switzerland, where that direct democracy is uh, used uh, uh, very frequently. And I also uh, wrote uh, a, a small book, uh, uh, la, part, la democrazia diretta vista di vicino for the moment just in Italian but they, they, uh, they are traducing it in, in some other languages uh, therefore um, uh, I am happy to contribute uh, if possible to uh, this uh, uh, better definition on the uh, mainly three forms on the uh, democracy thank you for your attention Thank you, Leonello. <clears throat> so we got uh, uh, Franco Levi, Samuele Nannoni, Massimo Nespola, Patrizia Pozzo, Robert Goya. And then we are done with the people listed to talk and we can go to all the conclusions. Franco Levi, five minutes. Ho mandata la proposta scritta e come mandate in giro le altre documentazioni scritte, chiedo che anche no, no, Franco, la in in English, this meeting. venga diffusa, perché noi... No, 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 Franco, it's in English, the meeting. If you speak Italian, you don't speak. I sent the proposal. It's in Italian. Someone is translating it in Hungary into Esperanto, Esperanto and into other languages such as Moguru, Hungarian and Japanese and so on from Esperanto. From for free? We, we have to translate all your documents for free or you're going to pay us? Ah, you, you'll buy the, if you don't hurry up and don't uh, share it now you have to buy and to pay for it. Clear. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Now so we have to translate and to pay you. you. Okay. You pay some money if you want. Uh, anyway, uh, the copyright is mine. And if you don't behave properly, you have to pay. And you want uh, one cent out of it. I earn a lot of money out of it. Now, Will you read it in Italian? Will you understand? Because we, the citizens of European Union, are half a billion people, one sixteenth of mankind. We can have democracy here. If in the other part of the world, democracy is just a joke or even some, something. Uh, Radical more than comical. So, if you read it, you can upset down the United Nations and make Mondo Democrazia, Mondo Repubblica, World Commonwealth. Thank you, Franco. Thank so, you, Franco. We will see if you, we can find translators for you. Can you close 30 seconds to close is your speech? Five minutes? Huh? Tempus fugit, as you say in English. Tempus fugit. Uh, now, if you, you come to Bergamo, you'll see maybe in, in the long queue of those coffins, you may see even mine. But what I suggest won't. Thank you, Franco. Cutting my tongue, Cutting you will. Tongue. After I die, you will. You won't be happy. Won't be happy. Thank you, Franco. 
Okay, after Franco Levi, we got uh, uh, Samuele Nannoni from Oderal, Massimiliano Nespola, Patrizia Pozzo, Robert Goya, Marco Ferraro, which I forgot earlier. So, Samuele Nannoni. Yes, hello, yes, hello. to everyone. Thank you for everyone. this opportunity and for this good meeting. Uh, I guess you heard me. Um, so, I'm just taking the floor just to say a few things because I uh mainly agree with um much of the people that uh, spoke uh, before me and um, so what i want to say is that well what we have to do at european level is just to uh, build up something something new okay just to use our our imagination because what uh, we uh, we have uh, we currently have is not uh, sufficient. Um, the things that I, I want to um, to to say is that uh, we don't have to believe that um, uh, to make um, in at the European level uh, things better, uh, we just uh, simply have to replace what we already have at the next level. Um, and for example. Uh, having a, an European Parliament with a legislative power of a, have a council uh, that is like uh, an American Senate. And, and this is, uh, won't be sufficient for a simple reason that is no more sufficient uh, at, the, at the national level too. And uh, as a proof of it is the fact that uh, from many years, from many decades, and in uh, quite all um, uh, democracy uh, here in the West or in, in Europe, uh, we see that the um, representative democracy uh, needs the support of uh, other kinds of um, democratic experiences and democratic means, such as the direct one and the participatory democracy and the deliberative one. And uh, such uh, tools, uh, such as the citizen assemblies, the random selected citizen assembly, um, have proved to be fundamental uh, in um, bringing the citizen at the core uh, of the uh, public decision making. And so strengthening uh, democracy, democracies um, themselves. So uh, this is, uh, I think, is very important. And Simona Bonfante previously said that, for example, uh, the problem that many states, uh, like such as Italy, are facing nowadays with the coronavirus uh, is that uh, in the last decade, uh, Italy, uh, so Italian politicians uh, have cut um, the uh, financing for the for the sanity. Uh, so uh, my answer uh, is. Uh, we, we the citizen, the Italian citizen in this case, um, uh, if they have, have the opportunity to uh, choose if to cut or not the financing uh, for the sanity uh, instead of giving the, that money, I don't know, for uh, military operation, uh, have decided to, to do it, I, I don't think so. Uh, so we have to, uh, to think that maybe the a citizen can, can be wiser than what we think. And so starting from th this point of view, we have to uh, think, uh, use our imagination to think another kind of Europe and understand that we have a, a big opportunity that uh, and what is, mm, is happening at the national level, uh, we, we have to learn from it and to start br um, uh, building up a new Europe, uh, not just uh, replacing what our democracy uh, at the national level are now, but already implementing with other uh, uh, other means of other kind of of democracy of um, democratic democratic kinds. For example, just to say something, uh, the idea of having uh, um, one of the of the for example, the, the European Parliament in Strasbourg as a, a place where to collect European citizens and just uh, uh, letting the uh, European Parliament in Bruxelles for uh, politicians, obviously, uh, together with the Council, uh, for me, it's a good idea. Obviously, as someone could say, there is the problem of the communication because 
we uh, are 27 countries with um, approximately 27 languages and so citizens could face the problem to communicate each other but i would also uh, say that if you if we want to do something we will do it and uh, obviously in a federal state such as uh, many of us uh, would be europe to become uh, a common language uh, would be I, th I think one of the first steps so english or whatever other language would be uh, a common and uh, a common language of, of this Europe, new Europe. And so also this gap uh, could be no problem tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. Uh, next one is, sorry. Next one is Massimiliano Nespola. And then we got Patricia yes. Posso. Yes, and here. And uh, I, yes, I want to say, and uh, I also wrote uh, uh, something in the documents. Uh, many thanks to the organizers for this opportunity uh, and uh, to debate together. This is very important as uh, European brainstorming. Uh, I think uh, I want to say that I think it's necessary to act at the uh, level of the former so called third pillar of the European ideation. And that's um, where uh, the, the European space for security, freedom, and justice. I think this could be the field in which to reform Europe, to better cooperate, to transform the European institutions, and to feel them closer than now to the citizens, to make uh, the, um, uh, be unmasked the, some non transparent powers inside the European economy and the European Union. Uh, moreover, this discourse is closely linked to the respect of the rule of law within the EU. Um, from this point of view, the European movement uh, for Italy is. Uh, um, promoting this uh, this issue, uh, the conference for the future of Europe could be the ideal platform to discuss about security, freedom, and justice. But the issue I proposed, in my opinion, is important independ independently from the conference. Uh, more, I didn't read the references to this uh, aspect inside the conference documents. That uh, was um, I wor I'm worried about it. Uh, I think that uh, occasions to debate like this, uh, like this meeting, are very similar uh, to the conference. Uh, the conference now, um, Virgilio Dastoli said, uh, is difficult to be realized because of the necessity of member states' unanimity. Uh, yes, and um, I finish um, i finish my intervention saying that uh, as journalists one time i realized uh, um, an interview to beatrice covassi um, as uh, for italian uh, when she was uh, the italian uh, representative for uh, the european commission in italy and she um, asked about uh, the opportunity to relaunch the constitutional debate, answered me that this was important, but not to overshadow the daily policies and the concrete problems. Similar answer for a new treaty. That's very important, but it is also important not to paralyze the European institution activity that uh, is already, uh, that already has uh, many difficulties to face. And uh, for the moment, that's all. Many thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, so we just checking the list. So we are in the last hour of today. And then uh, I just remind for those of you who are connected now, those of you who are re-watching the recording and who is following online, that the session tomorrow will be from 9.30 to 1.30 with a focus more specific on the policy. Um, and now we have Patricia Pozzo, Robert Goya, Marco Ferraro, Corentin, and, and Michele Fiorillo. Last one. Whoever registered from now on is going to fall into it. Thanks, Virginia. Uh, thanks to 
everybody. I do believe that we should have more and more meetings like that. Uh, but they will be very quickly, I know we are all tired now. So let's focus on a couple of points uh, that I would like to underline. First of all, it's quite clear that to all of us that this epidemic showed that there is no European Union now as we all thought that it. Whatever it is now, it's completely and definitely dead. But at the same time, uh, we should have uh, a really the last chance to think at it, uh, imagining the one we do like to move on. Um, and we must take advantage of two, uh, in a couple of points very important. The first one is that both the Federal Reserve and the BCE at the moment, they both still no, uh, don't know well, how to behave. I mean, we uh, all um, listened to Lagarde's statement a few days ago, uh, which was, uh, uh, I mean, which uh, leave us completely with no words. And uh, one another important point is that China at the moment, it's not more a, a doctor, but he, uh, he's a passion as well. Uh, and that could uh, offer us a good occasion to move on. Now, uh, Marco said before that uh, we, I mean, at least, uh, of course, we can rethink to reform the treaties, but uh, I perfectly agree that we can use now the one we have in a, in a correct way, transparently, first of all, but also in the correct way, uh, giving, reinforcing, of course, the European Parliament power. So uh, I'm sure tomorrow, I think, uh, we'll, we'll have more time for details, to enter in details of policies. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy to take part of it because uh, I don't understand. I, I'm I'm sorry. I didn't have um, a lot of time uh, before the me uh, this meeting to enter in all the draft. Uh, I uh, just understood we we could share together, but I will be happy to insert some some policies for tomorrow if you email me. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Patricia. Yes, apologies. You received the, I mean, we sent some of the documents a few days ago, but the um, working documents was sent today. So like where well, you can actually add it. So um, the, it's organized in three sections. The first section is a um, collaborative note about what we're discussing today. So it's a good space for brainstorm, comment to each other and interact on that. The second part was more a series of uh, questions and proposals around the um, instruments of participatory democracy in itself. And of course, you can edit also that part and uh, integrate it. And the last bit is a proposal of a draft of a petition to the European Parliament that we can discuss tomorrow that was prepared by some of our um, activists at Humans. Having said so, all of you guys, and this is our event, uh, the Council on Participatory Democracy, organized by multiple organizations. So uh, if European Alternatives, uh, uh, AC, then all of you want to try to make suggestions, we can make sure that we have uh, a double approach as an output of the meeting, where we have something that will need to be done sort of immediately. And of course, we will then need to, to define together how to to move forward considering that uh, it's very difficult to solve all the problems in one meeting even though it's a long one so uh, let's keep this in mind as we proceed so toward the end of the day um, Robert Goya is the third speech so be short please and then uh, Marco Ferraro, Corentin and Michele Fiorillo okay thank you very much <laughs> just because it's my third speech i will keep it very briefly and i would like to raise a point which also irina read in the notes have also raised 
about our short term uh, short term goals at the moment of how we're going to face the crisis and in order to address the crisis in order to enhance the solidarity which we've all talked about throughout the public opinion and in order to reestablish the eu's legitimacy as a as a as an institution as we've seen that in italy somebody has mentioned that the support for the european union is going more down and down i think we should if there is any way uh, address the eu uh, in order to trigger the european globalization adjustment fund this is a policy instrument which is particularly helpful in a financial in a financial situation where uh, workers are becoming obsolete due to globalization. And uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus, is an issue which uh, was helped by also by globalization. And therefore, it, this crisis represents an eligi eligibility criteria for the European Globalization Adjustment Fund. This fund basically allocates a couple of uh, finan uh, a financial help to member states who are financing uh, uh, workers who are uh, experiencing workers that are becoming redundant due to globalization. Therefore, uh, in this case, we can see that many people have become unemployed just because of the coronavirus, and we cannot see, we cannot foresee how long the coronavirus is going to stay. But this is this is this is a policy instrument which should be immediately de demanded by us in general in order to see some. European Union activity in general in order to re-establish our legitimacy as Europeans. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Uh, we do have Marco Pellaro. Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Okay. Yes, Thanks. we can. Thank you. So, um, I'll be hopefully brief. Uh, my name is Marco Ferraro. I am co coordinator of a young uh, Italian think tank called Europa Repubblica. The name already contains uh, what we stand for. Um, I would like to say a few words about uh, what treaty changes uh, might be necessary uh, in, in order to seize the opportunity of the Conference on the Future of Europe and the relaunch uh, a process leading to a united Europe. So um, I think this is partly a polemic, but not entirely so. Uh, one thing which is very necessary is just to apply the treaties, and in particular the principle of subsidiarity. If the principle of subsidiarity was applied uh, as it should be, now we would be facing these uh, epidemics with already uh, a european-wide uh, health security policy in place we would already be discussing uh, foreign aid uh, towards uh, uh, china or other um, third partners using a common uh, european uh, um, uh, diplomatic service and so on. So what I mean with this is that the subsidiarity principle, usually it is used by national governments to uh, block the way to the transfer of, co of competences to the European level. But the very same principle explains why some competences are indeed necessary at the European level. Subsidiarity wise, there is no logic why uh, dealing with uh, civil protection or um, pandemics as the one we are facing now shall remain a national prerogative. Does it, uh, is it a function which is exercised better at the national than at the European level? If the answer to this question is uh, no, then this competence by the subsidiarity principle shall be moved to the European level. The same applies I, as the examples I made to defense, does it make more sense to have defense as a national level or as at a European level? If the answer is no, then there is no subsidiarity argument for keeping defense as a national matter and so forth. But the, the most urgent and pressing case now 
is the is the pandemics and the absence of a european wide policy to deal with this uh, so instead leaving the, the the partial polemic but i don't think but i think this is a polemic that is worth uh, developing but instead going to specific treaty changes that i think are necessary uh, i think uh, one is the uh, full development of freedom of movement of uh, European citizens within the European Union. At the moment, this principle meets some limitations that are possible, for example, for public service. I think uh, that removing this limitation would go a long way towards creating uh, and empowering European citizens for uh, taking the full advantage of the opportunities that living in a united Europe uh, allows, including working into national uh, ministries uh, of, of, of a country which is not their, their uh, native country. And finally, I think that um, a further treaty change of a more ambitious scope, but I think this is, if we are not ambitious, then the ambition will not certainly come from the capitals of the member states. So being ambitious is not, a, I think, a disqualifier. I think it is a necessity. Uh, I think being more ambitious, we shall ask for uh, uh, transferring management of home affairs as a shared competence of the European Union. This is necessary to harmonize uh, management that, that is currently done by the Ministry of Internal Affairs of services that touch directly upon the life, daily life of citizens, like uh, simple things like uh, uh, administrative certificates, a birth certificate. If you live uh, if you live in Amsterdam and you are an Italian citizen, uh, you would have lots of. It wouldn't be easy for you to obtain this document where you live. The same for a French uh, woman living in Milan. There is no logic why this type of services uh, uh, shall continue to be the monopoly of uh, national uh, capitals. Uh, as an appendix to this, I, rem I remind that currently in, in Europe, there are 17 million Europeans who live and, and work in a European Union country, which is not their native uh, one. So I, I think uh, there is um, big, a, a, a very wide uh, scope for um, developing uh, policies that treat European citizens exactly as uh, Europeans and not as national citizens who also happen to have a second uh, European citizenship because their member state is part of the European Union. So this is what I wanted to say. Of course, it can be elaborated better in other uh, contexts, also in written form. I think I uploaded something. Uh, and thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Marco Pellaro. We have Valentin and then Michele Fiorillo, and then conclusions for the day. Yes. Hello, everybody. Sorry. Sorry, I, I just thought you, there wasn't any room for me to speak, so I'm glad I can speak. Thank you. So I'm just here to speak on the behalf of, of the, the French citizen movement I'm part of. Um, we are a movement that's been created in 2016 on the purpose to just give back the speech to the citizens in countries where the democracy is uh, clearly stolen by a system that is only representative and no, not only participative, no direct. And we're completely advocating for that. Um, I think in the times of crisis we're facing right now, um, our manifesto is more than ever um, necessary to to reflect upon. So we we edited um, we edited the manifesto in 2016. Um, that is 
stating that is stating six points. Um, and I think it would be a good base on which we can think about redefining the functionments, the functionments of our European Union. That is, I think I'm not speaking only on behalf of my movement, but I'm speaking for myself right now. Um, the crisis we're facing is going to ask deep changements, deep modifications to the way we we look at democracy and the way it applies to Union European, European Union. Sorry. So our manifesto has been made on six main points. The first one is we asking, and I think in European institutions would be a great thing is to ask for a renewing of the political representation that is to say every mandate the people is giving to people is not you can replicate a mandate once you've been elected you should pass it on on the next mandate to someone new so of course the main point here as many of you can think right now is to limit um, the uh, I was going to say propagation that um, to limit the professionalization of the politics. No one should make politics a career in no countries, especially not in European Union. Um, secondly, on a more local scale, um, no no par political parties. Um, should be able to to put a candidate that is not rooted in the local context. That is to say, if you're living in Paris, you can you can go and put a candidacy to rule a tiny village in the east. Uh, thirdly, our third point is to remove the Senate, that is the high chamber of our parliament, um, by a chamber that, that would be a a citizen senate that is to say uh, a room for our parliament that will contain only members that would be um forgotten in, in english um, um randomly by... selected <laughs> sorry randomly selected exactly exactly thank you um for our fourth point is to make uh, in france i don't know if you for non-French here, if you followed the recent, even before the crisis, the government was really facing a deep uh, legi legitimacy crisis. Uh, the people is not trusting it anymore for a long time now, but he, he just redesigned the whole uh, pension system for the elder people. And as the law, as the, the bill wasn't going to pass um, the parliament's uh, approval, it just in, invoked uh, one horrible law that's been created on the beginning of the, um, the fifth. Um, uh, sorry, we in the. Sorry, I just forgot uh, But since fifty-eight, the system we currently in still um, allows the government, the executive power, to pass a bill um, through by not necess necessitating the, the approval of the parliament. If there is a legislative um, block of the process, that is to say the parliament is not agreeing with the government, the government has the right through a horrible law that is named 49.3 to pass it without the approval. So that is completely anti-democratic. We are advocating for 49.4 that is to say, in this kind of case, the government could invocate uh, this law to present um, so the very bill that is threatening, that is not able to, to have the approval of the parliament um, in face of the, the people, to ask people um, advice, just inform the people that is able to, to speak uh, on this very issue. Uh, fifth, um, we, I think on European scale, it could be really nice as well. Um, there is a popular 
initially for every referendum. We got one in England, in, in European Union, sorry, that, that was thrown, I don't know if you remember, in 2016 for the, um, the NAFTA, uh, the trade agreement um, treaty with the North America. Um, we just rejected it by, um, we asked for, for, for throwing it by the window. It, it didn't happen. The commission just threw it in the bin. Uh, we're asking for real right for the citizen um, to ask for a referendum on some matters. Uh, in France, uh, the the threshold the, the threshold is uh, 500,000 uh, people signing it in order to have a referendum organized. I mean, the threshold will be higher in European Union, of, of course. Um, that is our first point of the manifesto. The sixth one is we'd like to see uh, real and truly impartial justice. Uh, justice that is not taking part in any case, that is only embodying the very principles at the core of this, the justice system. And for that, uh, on the model I just explained uh, earlier, um, we, will, we, we are advocating for uh, a special independent court that is constituted by magistrates, professional magistrates, but also citizens that are once again uh, randomly selected. Thank you. It's all our manifesto, but I really think we can take a look at this manifesto to think about uh, our democracy in general in the European Union. Thank you. Thank you very much. Last one is Michele Fiorillo from Civico Europe, and then we can add to all the conclusions. Yes. Um, yes. You know, Extinction Rebellion is calling for this, uh, was calling uh, for these citizen assemblies uh, uh, convocated by governments to deliberate, uh, to, to allow the citizen to deliberate accurately about the, um, the climate just transition. Um, and this is uh, something I think that has to, to do with our work because um, Yes, so already some of you already mentioned this uh, citizen assembly model, the randomly selected citizens. It's something that comes from uh, democratic theory since long time, the liberative democracy experiments. Maybe you know also uh, the experience of G1000 in Belgium. Uh, so this G1000 is instead of G8, you know, the, this, uh, the, the meeting of the powerful people. And this philosopher David Van Leybrook they wrote this a bit uh, with a title a bit provocative against elections in the sense not to be elected against election but that uh, the citizen can do things also beyond uh, the elected representatives and maybe you remember there were years in Belgium where there was not for two years uh, there was not an official federal government and citizens were able to out organize this was G1000 experiment in deliberative tables making recommendation that at the end also the political parties like the Greens uh, and others uh, uh, take in uh, in their own program. And um, now in Belgium, in the, if I'm not mistaken, in the Brussels parliament, uh, last two months, uh, right before this crisis, uh, was um, uh, approved a reform uh, pushed by this U1000 movement uh, where you will have experimentally commissions, parliamentary uh, commission with mixed participation of MPs and citizens randomly selected. Now, I think this could be something you can extend also on European level, no? mixed commissions of the European Parliament where you have also uh, transnationally selected citizen. We have to see how to do it uh, and then practically database, etc. Uh, as a proposal, now we could push this kind of, of proposal. And then there is the idea that many uh, of us debated in many <laughs> occasions uh, this idea of the uh, also an European citizen assembly as part of the lawmaking process of uh, the transnational democracy, uh, European democracy we want to, to build uh, up. So, of course, uh, Strasbourg Parliament is always blamed, saying, oh, it's uh, totally useless, you use that just one amount, once a month. 
Uh, maybe you remember Geremek, former president of the European Parliament, uh, the historian from Poland, once uh, proposed that the Parliament could become uh, also a um, European university, a popular one, uh, to be nearby the, the more elite one of the College of Europe, to form uh, at a really an European level with professors from uh, all Europe. Um, yeah. So, and of course, that could be the place uh, for an European citizen assembly, something that also Nicolo, in a way, was pro proposing. Um, and then um, I think uh, really, I don't know if there is someone, of course, many of, uh, of us, I think they are uh, participating to Fridays for Future Squares, etc. But I really think we, we would be uh, good to have some people from Fridays for Future Extinction Rebellion with us in the next meetings to debate also to the Green New Deal related topics. I think tomorrow uh, we, we will debate about that. And uh, this idea, for instance, with the Green New Deal campaign of the N25, we are pushing for this people assembly for, um, for environmental justice, which is an extension of the idea of citizen assembly. Because citizen assembly is uh, uh, Extinction Rebellion uh, ask that uh, is the government to institute that. And we say, no, we can out-organize that. And that brings me to my last point. Uh, so the idea that uh, is together with movements like Fridays for Future, Extinction Rebellion in Italy, we had these sardines, these new movement, or the, the feminist movements, uh, of course, the trade unions. Um, we really, we, we have the possibility to build up this constituent power, civil constituent power we were talking about. And yeah, now the difficulty is how to organize, uh, we already said in this moment, so uh, Marco mentioned uh, this fact that there will be the, the possibility that uh, we will have in the next months just the European Council or the European uh, uh, or the Council of the European Union or the Eurogroup uh, meeting in uh, the, maybe uh, or in person or telematic meetings. And what we do, even the Parliament is not maybe convocated. So why not to propose, for instance, and it's a proposition that I do to this uh, Council. Why not to transform us together also with other organization in a, a citizen council or people summit as something maybe remember Spinelli think that uh, Spinelli was organizing in the past as a, a counter council to the European Council. So each European Council, we know more or less the agenda of the European Council. We organize the day before a citizen council deliberating on the same matter and trying to push the agenda more forward than the head of states. And maybe inviting also the MPs of the parliament, they are willing to join us in the case the European parliament uh, is uh, also, let's say, uh, uh, diminish in its power in this situation. I think this would be a, a, a way, a concrete way to build up, uh, uh, to start, start to, to build up a civic and constituent power uh, in this, uh, in this crisis, and uh, as I said before, maybe we could use the CDIN platform, Zoom, uh, go to meeting, or any other plot platform we can think about. Uh, I finished. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, so we finished the um, uh, speeches from the participants. And uh, so just a quick summary of what's going to happen next. So basically, we're going to meet tomorrow at the same link at 9.30 and for, with you and all the other people that registered only for the sessions of tomorrow. Uh, and the focus is going to be basically mainly move to more, uh, uh, so we define some methodology and maybe Marco, Nicola and the others wants to wrap it this now. Uh, tomorrow we're going to focus more on the policy element and the, um, and the actual proposals. I remind you that in the document there are all the notes of the participants and there is also a draft of a petition to the European Parliament. So um, I guess Lorenzo who curated it uh, and, uh, and the other people can review that in light of what we discussed today. Uh, of course we can't take all the decisions in two days and come up with the direct action to be done uh, urgently as the um, moment requires. So most likely we will have to define our different layers of action. Some stuff that needs to be done immediately because they respond to the urgency and maybe other actions and uh, 
uh, ideas to be worked on in the medium and long term. And this is part of what, so that's a first meeting for a reason. Um, so I would leave Marco some time and also I don't know if Nicolò, Lorenzo and the others are still connected, but uh, maybe if the organizers wants to say, the, the first organizers want to say something that we can uh, close at six on time. Uh, Nicola Lorenzo, I don't know if you're still connected. Thank you, Gila. I'm okay. I think it's quite clear, and uh, um, I think that we can already uh, study the petition prepared by Lorenzo, but also everybody could uh, seize the opportunity of tomorrow to go more in, uh, in the specific issues that, of course, are not, are not in the agenda now because there is only one issue on the agenda, but uh, it's clear that uh, climate change is not stopping uh, or, uh, I mean, just to make an example. So I think we can go um, directly to the discussion of tomorrow morning. Eugenia, I'm afraid we cannot hear you. Villa, no microphone. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I was saying uh, that I shared the final notes again so that everyone, if you want, you can have a look before tomorrow's session or refine stuff, integrate stuff. I really want to thank not only all of us who stayed connected for four hours, uh, uh, but the people who followed on social media channels and also. Uh, all the people that worked on the organization of this, there was a lot of backstage work for this. So besides the co-organizers, I want to thank Roberto Mancuso who my, and Michael Brau managed the technical side and Carlo and Diana and uh, Lorenzo and Octavian and Sibilla who kind of uh, made sure that we had all the tools available for today and uh, in place. Plus, each organization and person came here with its own background, so it's great to share this kind of moment uh, uh, as Europeans and uh, let's go back home. Uh, thank you very much. See you tomorrow at 9.30 at the same link. Thank you, guys. Bye. Right, see you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. 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 Ciao. Bye. Ciao. Bye to all. Ciao.